Okay, we're recording. Okay, uh, my name is James Pepper. I'm the chair of the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Today is October 29th, 2021. Um, it's 11 a.m. and I call this meeting to order. Um, today we're going to continue to discuss and make decisions on some of the more granular aspects of our regulations. Um, we will continue to seek public input uh, both at these meetings, but also at our monthly after hours public comment meetings and throughout the rulemaking process. Um, we are working with our consultants to develop a few hybrid in-person and remote town, high, town hall style meetings around the state. Um, we're going to narrow in on those dates, times, and locations, and we'll make those details available as soon as possible. Um, though we're currently thinking Thursday, November 18th, and Saturday, November 20th. Um, and honestly, if these wind up being valuable and productive, I can see us expanding these um, in the coming months. Um, I don't have anything else, um, so have uh, Kyle and Julie, have you had a chance to review the minutes from um, both October 22nd and October 27th? Yes. Yes. Okay, I take a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, then why don't we just get straight into the agenda for today. Um, and Kyle, if you wouldn't mind starting with some of the kind of operational requirements um, that you were assigned. Okay, so for today, again, as, as you alluded to, we're getting pretty granular, uh, but Brent asked me to take a look at operational requirements or standards for um, cultivators, generally um, indoor specifically, manufacturers, retailers, including age verification, how we want to do that, wholesalers, visitors, and visitors just to cultivation operations, um, some integrated security conversation, and then what we're going to do with adulterated cannabis. I reviewed um, primarily requirements in um, Colorado, Massachusetts, California, amongst others. Um, the Sustainability Committee helped inform um, what I'll be talking about on my next slide, which is helping to develop a cultivation or a farm plan and also for disposal of adulterated cannabis and just kind of listing um, some of the primary folks that I have been um, engaged in discussing with over the last week um, to help inform um, my thoughts here. So first, cultivator-specific operational requirements. I kind of view this, um, you know, some of this will be included in our application. Some of it, I think, is just good business or farm planning um, for anybody who looks to seek a cultivation license. This is record keeping that will be really valuable at the end of each season to kind of assess um, how they're doing, um, how successful they were. Also, if something does go wrong, um, how we can um, make sure that we in, in, in implement corrective action plans and kind of understand what exactly happened. Um, I don't anticipate this being overly burdensome. You know, some of the other cultivation or farm plans I've seen in other jurisdictions are about 10 pages or so. Um, very, very top line, but we, I think it's important that we understand exactly um, how folks intend to operate here. So a cultivation schedule or description of cultivation activities, how they're planning to grow, how they're planning to propagate or start. Um, mixed light cultivation plan and schedule if they're gonna be doing one, irrigation plan and schedule if they're gonna be using um, municipal water. Um, harvesting, drying and trimming. Uh, what are your efficiency practices? I think we're still gonna talk about prioritizing folks with a sustainability angle in mind. So recognizing that folks want to give us information to help prioritize their application, I thought um, having a baseline understanding of what we need from an efficiency perspective is important in a plan, recognizing that we want folks to, to go above and beyond that. Um, an employee plan, if, you, if you're more than a sole proprietor, you know, who's in charge, who's the lead cultivator, assistant cultivator, seasonal laborers, if you need them. Um, yeah, and again, applicable, applicable based on scale of operation. Um, use and storage of regulated products. What are you planning to use um, as part of your 
as part of on-farm applicators as part of your process. So nutrients, pesticides, fungicides located in a locked storage room, uh, locked and labeled containers in accordance with the manufacturer of that pesticide or, or applicator, applicator's instructions. We'll talk a little bit more about pesticides in a little bit, but more or less we're going to, the Agency of Agriculture does a lot of tests and approves people to be able to handle these types of products. And I think it's prudent that we kind of make sure we work side by side with them so that people are doing this safely. Integrated pest management. How are you going to prepare for the unexpected, whether that's spider mites or molds, um, bursitis, anything like that? You know, I don't think any of us want, of course, those to impact a facility's operation, but you need a plan in place in case the unexpected does happen. I think you know, and I think we've all experienced this in a lot of different ways in our in our lives. If something starts to go wrong, you get a little anxious and you start to make decisions that you may otherwise slow down and think a little bit more strategically about. And we don't want folks who don't have a plan in place to start using applicators that they might otherwise not use, but they're trying to do their best to save a crop that they feel is failing and they might be more inclined to you know, use something that's not approved or use something in a mis in a misuse type of way. And so I think it's important that we kind of get people thinking about that and what could go wrong at the beginning. Um, follow the pesticide rule, um, waste management plan, how you're going to dispose of um, non high THC, you know, leftover material, so on and so forth. Um, product management, um, what's your testing plan, who you're going to use if you have one. Uh, a lab that is, um, and your plan to control inventory before it's transporting, before it's transported, and then record keeping, maintaining records. You know, again, this gets back to best management practices in case something does go wrong. That's great. And we can, you know, develop kind of a, a guide or a checklist um, and give some examples on what this looks like. Again, I don't anticipate it being overly burdensome. Um, it's just kind of, it, I think it's mutually beneficial for us to understand growing practices, but also mutually beneficial for folks, um, you know, to, to have their ducks in a row in case information is needed by us. Okay, so pesticides, as I mentioned, you know, the Agency of Agriculture has the state wide authority to regulate pesticide use. They offer training and certification and licensing and registration for product pesticide applicators and dealers and registers specific products and active ingredients. It operates um, a pesticide program that fully addresses all as aspects of pesticide use, including mixing, storage, disposal, worker protection standards, et cetera. It has a list of allowed ingredients that the CCB should adopt, and they have a list that was created while we are still on our, well, we're still on our hemp pilot program now. Um, because I don't believe that plan has been approved by USDA. But um, EPA, after hemp became legalized, has started to step in and, and offering uh, approved pesticides, so on and so forth, for use on hemp crops. But this was developed um, before that. And I think that kind of helps us thread a needle because EPA is not going to be approving pesticide usage for high THC cannabis because it's still federally illegal. So at the, I think also like what what maybe important is an application report or an after season report. So the time of harvest or the time this is transported indicate what pesticides you have used as part of your operation. It's hard for people to kind of list at the beginning because they might not end up using certain applicators. Um, but I think it's important for the public to know what has been included as part of that approved list on your product. And so I thought, I know we talked about the manifest last time, maybe this could be a part of the manifest or something similar that kind of you you include when you go to transport um, your material to make sure that everybody understands what was specifically used on that product. Trace has, um, I think most of the seed to sale have a way to kind of like list signal by batch okay. and then you have to kind of like the batch has like a file that you kind of maintain as to everything that's been done to that. Awesome. That makes it even easier yeah. to include. Just wanted to make sure we flagged it. Yeah. Okay. Standards for, for indoor cultivation. So they can propagate, cultivate, harvest, prepare, cure, package, store, and label under the license. 
can tra can transport to a licensed retailer, cannot transport, cannot transfer, excuse me, to a consumer, cannot consume on premises. They can store inventory on premises, but it needs to be in a secured, secured in a control area and tracked with seed to sale. Can only transfer between license holders. Um, I'm thinking they can provide samples to a testing facility, of course, you know what I mean, to maintain uh, for for testing and research purposes. I think we need to start thinking about research in a way that other states are starting to with respect to high THD cannabis. Um, and to maintain record of sample amounts of testing. Um, indoor cultivators are subject to inspection of its premises by local fire department, building inspector or enforcement officer to confirm no health or safety concerns are present. They may, I'm proposing, provide vendor sample of flour to a manufacturer or retailer. It cannot be consumed on any licensed premises. And you can supply a manufacturer or a retailer four grams per strain of flour, no more than seven strains of flour um, in an aggregate calendar month, which equates roughly to an ounce of cannabis. And that would need to be labeled not for resale um, and designated as such in seed to sale. Additionally, um, may provide samples to employees to, to determine whether or not to make a product available to sell. The same rules above would apply in terms of quantity. It would need to be labeled quality control and I spelled the word control wrong. That's going to need to be fixed on my slide deck, Bryn. Sorry about that. Uh, but it would need, need to be a um, designated quality control sample, not for resale. Massachusetts does this and has the same limits. I didn't necessarily dig into standards for outdoor cultivation as part of this, but I would expect that these same samples would apply for outdoor cannabis cultivation as well. Kyle, can I ask a question about that? The, yeah. um, is labeling it as quality control sample, that's how it would be tracked in their inventory, right? So when when they're when we go or when somebody goes in and audits their inventory, that's how they would signify that this was not something that you know went was diverted in any way, but this was this was for a quality control sample or it was a vendor sample versus Correct. a sample. Okay. Yeah, and the inventory or C to sale has this ability. Other states okay. allow for samples to help an operation itself determine if they want to move a product into the regulated market, but also, you know, a, a letting a vendor test it to make sure test it in the in the ways that we consume cannabis products um, to make sure it's something that they want to sell or they want to use in the manufacturing process. OK, thank you. Other other and Julie, I think you touched on some of this last week and you may even um, a little bit today, but sanitary requirements. You know, if folks have open lesions or boils and their job is to handle these plants, I think, you know, it's, it's a public health issue and we need to make sure that, that folks who are handling these plants are doing so with the public health practices in mind, hygienic practices while on duty, maintaining adequate personal cleanliness, washing hands thoroughly in an adequate hand washing area, hand washing facilities and restrooms, adequate and convenient, and making sure litter and waste is properly removed to minimize odor and becoming an attractant for harborage or breeding um, place for pests. I, I know that the hemp program also largely follows a lot of the produce program safety rules. You know, cannabis is interesting because it's one of the few examples in, in ag where it's not really washed from the point of it being grown, obviously, to the point of it being consumed. So there's got to be some good san sanitary best management practices in place. Um, from a public health perspective. Any questions there? No, that makes sense to me. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Okay, visitors to cultivation sites. Um, visitors are allowed, must be escorted at all times by a person, um, facility employee. We've been calling them cannabis licensed agents. And sorry that I didn't think to put that right there. Um, unescorted visitors could result in a license violation. They must be over the age of 21. I'm not recommending a specific number be set on the list, the number of visitors at one time. I think that could get a little hard for us to regulate, especially with small farmers who this is part of their diversified operation, who counts as a visitor um, when you're looking at other parts of the farm and people coming and going as part of a farm happens day in and day out. 
Um, I also think, you know, this will help promote aspects of agritourism. You know, this isn't an agriculture product per se, but I, I really want folks to feel comfortable and seek out opportunities to demystify the growing process around cannabis because it takes, you can't just have a PhD in botany and really grow this effectively. It takes a different set of skills and time and, and understanding of this specific plant. And so to facilitate that kind of education, folks want to see where their product is being grown, how it's being grown, um, so on and so forth. I think it's it's important for us to let visitors come under the, uh, the right set of circumstances to be able to view how this is actually grown. Um, so visitor identification badge issued by license holder. I figured the design should be approved by us and visible at all times that can be returned on exit. So you can you know, reuse those for every visitor. I was unsure if we should require this for craft outdoor cultivators. Something about wearing a visitor badge at a thousand square foot grow just seemed a little silly to me. But if we think it should be necessary, I'm think, willing to ent ent entertain the conversation. I think just overall, there should be some kind of diversion prevention plan that's part of the application process. Just uh, I think that's that's generally I think what other states just call it, just like diversion prevention plan. It's usually tied to retail operations, um, but uh, I think if we're going to allow visitors to cultivation sites, there should just that that and it could include it could you know it could include a badge or it doesn't necessarily have to for all, all cultivation types okay i'd be i'd be interested in further entertaining and we can explore through the proposed rulemaking process on what a diversion plan yeah. you know would look like and, and a lot of what i have here can be incorporated into this into that right. what that plan exactly. yeah. is um but you must be logged in and logged out and made right. available to us on inspection and I have here a safety protocol must be established before allowing visitors. And maybe we can attach diversion to the safety protocols. But for example, you know, I come from the ag world, disposable shoe covers to protect and increase biosecurity is something that you see when you're going farm to farm yeah. to farm all the time. Eye protection if you're at an indoor facility, you know, and exposed to horticultural lighting equipment. Um, I don't think it would be overly burdensome to come up with to come up with that plan. Julian, questions? Uh, no, this uh, actually the no limit on on number of visitors at one time. So this is for outdoor, or is it for outdoor and indoor? I was thinking either. Okay, so uh, would be no limit on visitors except for whatever the the fire code is, right? Yeah, I, yeah. I think that makes sense. So we can note we can note that. I didn't want us to impose an arbitrary number. You know, a fire safety code isn't an arbitrary number that's that's right. rooted in yeah and safety you know so Claire. this looks good okay adulterated cannabis i think what we need to do really is in, in our um authorizing legislation allows for remediation of adulterated cannabis if it can be concentrated and turned into something that's useful but i think what where we need to draw the line is if someone is adulterating um with an intent to circumvent our program or approved pesticides are doing so willfully. If so, it needs to be flagged, recorded, reported, must be destroyed. And when we talk about the word destroyed, um, it needs to be rendered unrecognizable and unusable as found in our waste disposal recommendations that I discussed last Friday. Yeah, on this, it's just, I think it's probably inherent in our authority that we can demand sampling and testing of, pro of products kind of at our discretion. I would imagine, but it's something that I have for my, I just noted it for my integrated license um, operational requirements, but it seems like if we don't have that inherent authority, we should demand, we should make sure it's clear um, as part of our rules that we can, that we're going to do that if we suspect adulterated cannabis. I think, I think we can, and I think in the statute, it does say that we can destroy its standards designated by the board. Okay, so. Sure. It's something, some iteration of that, but it does specifically allow for remediation. Um, but I still think we we help decide when something is so, or a public safety concern where, you know, it can't be remediated. All right, I accidentally put a double slide in there. I apologize for that. Too many slide decks being created over the last week. 
Okay, standards for manufacturers. A lot of this is just, um, you know, I think we still need to talk about what would be allowed and not allowed from a, a solvent or a extraction method right. perspective, right? But this is kind of just good business practices for folks that are looking to do manufacturing. So maintaining all records of purchase from any manufacturer or supplier of an ingredient, additive device component, part of other materials obtained by the manufacturer, records would be available to us. Maintain records in the name of business address of the manufacturer of any cartridge, battery, atomizer, coil, hardware, or other component and vaporized products. Again, made available to us on request for, for more edible related um, parts of the manufacturing process. Uh, COA for each thickening agent, thinning agent, or terpene infused or incorporated into a product shall be retained by the manufacturer and provided in transactions to a wholesaler or a retailer. Policies and procedures for ensuring and safety in all processing activities related to the extraction equipment and compliance with Vermont Fire and Building Safety Code. And, and similar to the samples available from a a cultivator. I think it's important that manufacturers are allowed to do something similar. And the, this is the same aggregate amount a month, five grams of concentrator extract or 500 milligrams of edibles. Um, so long as the sample size doesn't um, exceed a certain amount and regulatory potency. Um, this is the same that Massachusetts allows as part of their sample program. And again, just like um, in the cultivation context, allowing your employees to kind of test to make sure it's a product that you want to hang your hat on in, in passing through the supply chain. A quality control sample, not for resale, should be allowed, I think, as well. For these samples, um, are we thinking that these samples, both at the cultivation level and at the product manufacturing level, have been tested? Um, you know, for microbial or they need our lab test standards prior to them being given out as samples. I think that, I think, yes, I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Yep. This is kind of like your, your, your taste test before you send it up the supply chain, yep. recognizing that everything else should kind of be ready to roll. Yeah. Great wholesalers, you know, I think it's a similar feel to an indoor cultivation security. Um, with a little bit different twist, um, recognizing that a large quantity of inventory may be present at any given time in a wholesale facility. So security alarms and locks on all perimeter doors and windows, video, surve video surveillance with continuous monitoring of storage control area, inventory needs to be locked and stored. Um, I think there needs to be a system in place to track product to keep separate product from different cultivators or different if folks this year um, wholesaling on behalf of. I think that our seed to sale would maintain that, but I think it's just good business practices. How our product can be handled and stored. You know, some folks will look to kind of store and, and preserve certain potency limits over the course of like a calendar year. There are certain humidity levels and temperatures that are used as storing techniques to kind of preserve the quality of something. So I think it's important that we um, understand how folks intend to actually um, store large quantities of this. Um, a certain size safe dependent on quantity um, bolted to the ground. I don't know if that's a, a necessarily something we need to require, but I thought it would be a discussion point. You know, we can kind of look to um, propose something in rulemaking and kind of hear back if we're being overly burdensome, I kind of figured, but you know, there needs to be special attention paid to wholesalers and in this context, recognizing the large inventory that could be present um, as part of their license. Is Again, story. Kyle, for product or for cash, or what is the safe for? For product. Okay. That's what I was primarily thinking of. But and, and cash too. I guess maybe if I'm thinking about it, I would have to be a pretty big safe, depending on <laughs> certain circumstances. So maybe it's more for cash. Okay. Do other states have that? You know? I think so, yeah. Yeah. Um, storage under conditions that, you know, will not degrade the product or the packaging. And we would need a list of authorized representatives representatives that are that are able to access this control area where this product is being stored. I know that in some jurisdictions this has been problematic the way that certain seed to sale um, 
companies or vendors work because the owner or the key holder is the only person allowed to, to enter these certain areas, which just creates practical issues depending on if the owner is in in that space on any given day or on vacation or something like that. So I thought if we have a list of authorized representatives, instead of just one single person who can access it, and that's on file with us, and we know and can track who has access, that we could still kind of yeah. um, help this work a little bit more in practice. Can I ask one more question about wholesalers? Kyle, is there a yeah. need for wholesalers to be able to receive or to give samples? I'm just trying to think about what their role will be sort of in the supply chain. I have a little bit of that on my slides, okay. Julie. Yeah, I mean, we can we can save the conversation for your slides. Unless you had something. I didn't include it here. Um, I could be persuaded that they would be allowed. Um, I guess the the repackaging stuff kind of. Or... I'll I'll talk I'll talk a little bit about it on my slides. Okay. Okay, so retailer operations. Um, I've heard a lot about obviously prepackaged um, materials. I'm also going to propose that we allow retailers to do what's can, what's referred to as deli style sales and think about this and the ability to open a larger jar, allow consumers to look at the product, smell the product, become familiar with the product as opposed to just behind a glass window um, to kind of help inform exactly what they want to buy. Um, and, and it's consumer preference and, you know, we wouldn't be the only jurisdiction in the adult use or medical world that would, that is currently allowing this. COVID has kind of uh, put some parameters around this, but with the hope that we might find ourselves in a post-COVID world at some point, although I feel like I'm beating a dead horse saying that, um, you know, I think this ability, um, is just in line with what consumers want to see when they go to a retail, you know, facility. I mean, we all go to the grocery store and we want to look at produce or whatever the case may be and pick pick it based on our preference. I think it just this kind of gets into that a little bit more. That being said, if somebody wants to do deli style, they need to develop a, a standard operating procedure that addresses all aspects of sales. So product reception, making sure a product is weighed, labeled, and repackaged appropriately. That SOP needs to be approved by us. Their scale and equipment must adhere to BAFM's weight and measures program. They do all of the weights and measures for the entire state, whether it's at a gas station or at an agriculture, you know, processing facility, so on and so forth. Um, and again, like similar to some of my other slides, they can receive vendor samples of flour from a manufacturer or cultivator. And I don't have it on here, but I would I would imagine they can receive sample concentrates and edibles as well, just like a manufacturer can give those out. They can receive them, but I ran out of room on the slide. Um, and they would just be labeled vendor sample, not for resale, and then allowing their employees to sample products to make sure it's something that they want to include at their retail operation. Quality control. Again, I apologize for my misspelling of the word control. <laughs> Not for resale. Um, so on the deli style, um, I guess first, do other are there other jurisdictions that allow that? Yes. You know which ones off the top of your head? I know in the medical world, Maryland allows it and Florida allows it. And um, just. To flesh out a little bit, I'm not opposed to the idea, but to flesh out a little bit, are you suggesting that there might be like a jar that someone could look at, or would it be like a single like flower that someone could inspect? Like I'm thinking these would be like big gallon sized mason jars that are behind a glass counter. And I think Julie's gonna talk a little bit more about displays and stuff like that, but this jar could be brought to the top of the display counter and somebody could inspect, you know, you can have those microscope lights and stuff like that that somebody maybe the bud tender could hold on behalf of a of the customer under a certain set of circumstances to inspect it i don't think we would allow customers to kind of put it in their hands that's kind of like a public health yeah, right. issue but under the right set of sanitary circumstances allowing 
that package to be opened and inspected um, by the customer before it's bought. Yeah, I mean, I conceptually, I'm okay with it. It's the sanitation aspect, the sanitary aspect. I think that we would have, and again, we're in a in a, a heightened sanitary world these days with right. COVID. Um, but I think again, if as long as a standard operating procedure for addressing sanitary conditions is in place, right. I think this is in line with how folks want to buy and inspect a product before they they do so. We're in we're in this world where customers want to know what they're buying more so than ever. And this kind of lends right. into that. Yeah, and again, I would like the san sanitary aspects and the diversion prevention. I mean, this like having these larger jars, like, you know, you could see how, you know, just like some diversion could happen just by the nature of there being large, un like not sealed packages. Um, so, so on this slide, um, not to get ahead of the conversation, because if we still want to talk about deli style, I can I can go back. But I think a retailer would have to have a written operating procedure, and in here and just touching, there's a lot of stuff in here. But touching on what you're talking about, policy for immediate dismissal of an employee who has diverted or engaged in unsafe practices. I figure if you're going to do deli style, you need to really have a, a robust plan on how you're going to and all of the security that we're requiring of retailers coupled with their written operating procedures, I think we can overcome those those diversion concerns. Yeah, I think so too. I just want to make sure that that's part of the conversation, that this opens the door to a few, I think, of the coal memo priorities. So I think we need to just have a, a you know, something we can hang our hat on to say that we have a plan, we have a plan for that. So I think we can overcome that burden. Yeah. Can I, <clears throat> Kyle, uh, on the deli style, it's you're not thinking that it would be like th there's a, a mason jar product that can be inspected and then there's a separate product that's packaged and that's what you get. This would be like you would be selecting from that jar or is it um, that which, I guess I'm not sure which which it is or is it uh, both? Could it be both depending on the retailer? I was I was thinking of it in a um, in the context of what you see is what you're what you get. I think yeah. either either way could work and maybe it would even alleviate some of your concerns if like they had like a sample jar that you could look at knowing that it's from the strain same strain harvest batch so on and so forth it's already prepackaged. Um, yeah, I, I think either way it could work. Okay, I just was trying to picture it in my mind, and I had the same concerns about um, just sort of the public health and sanitary aspect. But I think that those can be covered in in policy and standard operating so, procedures. And just for everybody, Bryn's showing me a, a photo of um, in Colorado. They have like sniffers, so kind of like what, what you're talking about, Julie, where you've got a certain strain that you can sniff and look at, but that's not necessarily the same bud that you would be taking home with you that day. Yeah. But I still think either way it'd work. I might, you know, want to say I want this bud specifically, right? So, you know, um, I think it's all in the name of consumer preference. Okay. But if we're okay with this, we can explore through. Yeah, I think conceptually I'm fine with it. I think we have enough to go on in your slides to kind of fine tune, you know, as we get closer to the submission of rules. Okay, great. Okay, so the rest of these written operating procedures, they're pretty, they're pretty standard. If um, and you can tell I was doing this at 11 p.m. last night, so I apologize for my spelling errors. I will have them fixed before these go up online. I think I said, where did I say something? I forgot the S on strains and it just says trains. We're not talking about trains here. We're talking about <laughs> strains. <laughs> My apologies to everybody listening. Okay, age verification. You know, some states require these limited access areas where you're kind of waiting in a vestibule or a waiting room and you're kind of shuttled to the back of, of the business establishment where the actual 
um, cannabis is being held. And um, I decided to tack away from that. This is a little bit how Massachusetts does it and other um, jurisdictions do. Um, the, the one I, I said previously was like how Colorado looks, looks at doing this. And I think we can move away from and learn from that. And I think what we want to do in a retail establishment is kind of, you know, you have two checkpoints where you need to show your ID at the door. Somebody needs to be approved that you are over the age of 21. And then on point of sale, somebody will inspect your identification and determine your age. Um, I don't think a retailer can acquire or record more information than somebody's willing to give. You know, if you have an email list recognizing our advertising rules and you want to sign up for something, that's great. Um, but it's not required other than the information that's shown um, on your ID and your age. But but this is kind of aiming at, you know, you get you enter a retail facility and you have the ability to walk walk around and look at products that are behind, you know, certain restricted display cases, not so that you have to sit in a waiting room to be called back. However, you know, if, if things are getting too crowded, um, a retailer has to make a reasonable effort to kind of limit the the amount of folks within a retail establishment as to to make sure that it, they can they can do their business safely. And um, we're we're not allowed to do um, uh, curbside sales, if I recall. That's right. But um, we could. Not that I think that we should, but we could encourage folks to have some sort of like online RSVP system or like kind of where you select a window where you're going to try to attend. I mean, I, of course, like the fear is that there's going to be lines around the block, uh, you know, if you're managing it like a bar that has a max capacity. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an option. I don't know if I want to require something I wouldn't want to require like that. Some either. folks, you know, want yeah. to just go on a whim and go say, yeah. I want to do this, you know. So, but I think that's an option if it's not running afoul of our inability to do curbside, if you're just indicating to the business what time of day within yeah. an hour or half right. hour you plan on coming, making an appointment, yeah. so to speak, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Well, we can think about that. I, I, I'm, I, I think this is fine. I mean, honestly, like, uh, and, and again, and I think if we do move in a delivery direction or a curbside option, if that ever enters our our market, there would need to be more information retained by the the person purchasing than just their paper. Yeah. Okay. The last slide I have is on integrated security. And I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel here. I think if somebody's seeking a business is seeking an in integrated license, you know, they need to follow the security laid out for all other license types. Um, and I thought and this is taking some language, I believe, from Colorado, an establishment conducting operations under multiple license types on a single premises may establish limited access areas for each license activity that overlap in shared hallways and access points, provided that operations under each license type are segregated and a licensed agent has access only to areas and activities are conducted pursuant to the license for which they are registered. All that's saying is we need to see, we recognize that a lot of this will happen in the same facility, not necessarily though, but recognizing that there will be distinct areas between operations. And we need to account for those as well. Yeah, I mean, one thing I really don't want to have happen is to have a because all the integrated licensees will have a, a medical uh, license as well, a medical retail license. You really don't want to see like if those are co-located that the, the adult rec retail is crowding out medical patients that are trying to see, you know, their products. So I know most states require separate entrances and maybe a partition between the medical side and the adult rec side. Um, you know, I didn't include that in my. I didn't either, but we can talk about it. Yeah. I think I think I think the from what I understand, 
I, I think there's even a recommendation from the trade association to that effect that they have these separate entrances. So I don't like I, w- I don't mind requiring it. I don't mind requiring that either. Um, and I think it kind of speaks to maintaining adequate supply and, and suite of services for the medical patients. Yeah. And they all. Well, go ahead, Julie. I think there's a patient protection aspect to that as well. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I was thinking about this more in the operational back end of things. So my apologies for not including the retail front focus of the medical and retail. No, no, that's fine. No. Um, And I know all the existing dispensaries currently have a, um, a system to like request a time to go. They, they have one of they they are all, they're all by kind of all appointments. You can walk into one, but you can also do it by invitation currently. Um, okay, yeah. But we can use this language and then add to it, and it'll it'll be in our proposed rule. I think separate entry and partition for the medical side. If if you're co-locating with your retail location, you have a separate entrance and partition for medical. You all right with that, Julie? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Sorry again about my misspelled word. screen but I, I can't do the presentation mode. Do you want to do it from my computer? Use your computer very much? That's all right. I think it's good enough, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm looking at wholesaler specific operational requirements, integrated specific operational requirements, and then the priority of licensure system. So um, just uh, just a quick, you know, from Act 164, definition of wholesaler, person licensed to purchase, process, transport, sell cannabis products. Um, wholesaler license may purchase from a licensed cultivator, an integrated licensee, um, and cannabis products from a product manufacturer, um, and then transport, process, package, sell cannabis, cannabis process products to a licensed product manufacturer, retailer, integrated license, and dispensary. Um, so wholesaler specific operational requirements, This, these top two are just, they're the same um, as kind of any person who's receiving um, a delivery. This is from last week's slides, just they have to ensure that what they're getting is what's described on the manifest and then they need to update their seed to sale tracking or their inventory tracking system um, to adjust, to account for that intake. Um, and then they will be responsible if there's any discrepancy between the manifest and what they're receiving um, to uh, document that and notify us. Um, so anything additional here? Um, what I did was I really looked at what Department of Liquor Control does for um, wholesalers. Um, these first two are not part of that, but they're pretty obvious. And I think we would require this for everyone. So it's not actually an additional requirement, but ensure that all the kind of labeling and packaging requirements are satisfied with what they're kind of passing along the, the supply chain. Um, have a process for defective products in return um, so, you know, if a retailer says, or if one of our compliance people is, you know, pulls something off the shelf at a retail location, you know, they can trace it back. And if it was from the kind of wholesaler, they can kind of, we can trace it back and have a return or defective product protocol. Um, Department of Liquor Control has the next, I think, four as part of their wholesaler requirements, just sales and use certificates from Department of Tax. 
um, proof of training um, regarding our cannabis laws, um, copy of lease and proof of ownership of the property that you're occupying um, that's being licensed. You know, again, a lot of these I think would be standard requirements for all license types, but um, just good to get them out there. Yeah, I, think um, I, I think I reviewed some of those in security. Yeah, or baseline exactly. have, I don't know, yeah. something like that. We've talked about that at this yeah. point. Just all, all requisite insurance, um, including um, general liability, product liability, and workers' comp. Um, and then so the, the, this is, you know, the wholesaler on the alcohol side is actually, it's somewhat news to me. I, I haven't really, like, thought about it all that much. But um, they're actually very highly regulated, both at a federal level and um, at a state level. Um, because of, you know, a wholesaler really can put tremendous pressure on retailers um, with, you know, contractual obligations and, and essentially bribes. Um, you know, there's, they call them inducements and exclusions rules. Um, and what they are, an inducement is anything that a wholesaler is giving to a retailer to persuade them to have their product prevalent at the exclusion of other products um, and so they can you know pay for advertising they can you know gift gift um, equipment fixtures signs money services anything of value and then um, the exclusion is you know the retailers taking that at the you know at the exclusion of other folks so this is really kind of an anchor on a craft cultivator market you know it really allows larger wholesalers and distributors to dominate the retail market. You know, I was talking to one of our advisory committee members and he was saying, uh, analogize this to, you know, the early days of like the music industry where like, you know, DJs were, you know, paid under the table to play certain songs and those songs became the hits, whereas other songs were, you know, just kind of never heard. Um, so there's a lot of federal regulation and then state overlays to that, state exceptions and kind of further um, restrictions um, on these inducements and exclusions. Um, and you can see them mostly in uh, 27 USC 205B um, is a good kind of like way to get a primer on some of this. Skylar Ganest, who's the head of enforcement for liquor control, um, did a hour long kind of public service uh, educational uh, video. I've linked to it here in the slide. Um, so, um, you know, Julie, Kyle, anyone who wants to kind of learn more about inducements and exclusions um, should really watch that video because it's really kind of a wholesaler specific concern. And I say wholesaler, it's really anyone who can sell to a retailer, which in our, um, in our industry will include cultivators and product manufacturers. So this is something that we need to consider, I think, for those license types as well. So um, we could just say for wholesalers that they need to be in compliance with kind of alcohol trade practices, um, you know, the ones that at least make sense for cannabis, um, both the federal and the Vermont ex exemptions um, or exceptions and additional requirements. You know, when I was talking to Savan, um, you know, he, he was saying really like, you know, you could just say something like there needs to be consistency. So if a specific wholesaler is saying you buy, you know, five pounds from me, you get the sixths for free. Or if you buy from me, um, I'll give you, uh, you know, 100 free samples or something like that, then um, that has to be consistent for every retailer. You can't have specific deals um, for specific retailers and, and really try and like, you know, that was just one kind of really baseline thing that we could require. Um, just kind of have a consistent practice. Um, you know, I'm not saying that every wholesaler has to sell at the same price or have the same um, kind of inducements um, but they can't uh, tailor them towards the specific retailer because that kind of crosses a, a little bit of a boundary. Um, Pepper, I think we included pricing strategy in our baseline application yep. required. So I wonder if that 
itself and that will have sort of a big picture market view of what type of pricing strategy wholesalers might be coming up with. Yeah. And I think that should be, yeah, I think that's a good way to kind of deal with the kind of consistency issue to make sure that um, they're not cutting side deals and kind of pushing out small craft products from retail stores. I think that makes sense. Okay. So we're not going to do, I mean, Brent, can you, when you look through this, eliminate the compliance with alcohol trade practices and leave kind of um, the the consistent okay. yep. consistency um, amendment or requirement. And I, you know, this uh, it w is new to me. I was learning about it yesterday and today. So I think that we should leave this conversation open for further refinement um, if we need to. And I, I asked David and Brent to kind of do um, some some research on this and see um, see see what we need to do um, if if we need to go beyond this. So moving on to integrated specific operational requirements. Um, I've got some that are dedicated to the application phase and the renewal phase. So um, some of these are just specific to Act 164 and Act 62. Um, I'm sure you remember that, um, well, the plan to provide reduced cost or free cannabis to patients with documented verified financial hardships. It's my understanding that, that the current medical dispensaries try to do this to the extent they can, have sliding sliding scales and fees. They are kind of limited um, in what they're allowed to produce. So in some ways, I, I think you know it can be difficult for them, but in this new world we're moving into, I think there should be, they should be required to at least provide a plan for um, kind of increasing accessibility for people that can't afford um, to use the dispensaries. Um, plan to ensure 25% of cannabis flour sold between August 1st and October 1st is obtained from small licensed cultivators. That's a requirement of Act 62. Um, those dates are the dates that they used in Act 62. Um, I have no problem with trying to push this, to having a plan, uh, you know, that's an ongoing plan. Um, but uh, that those are the dates that um, are from the legislation. Any comment on, on that one? Is there so, any? yeah, an ongoing plan, I think that would be a good idea. Me too. Yeah, okay. So why don't, Brynn, if you mm -hmm. could just eliminate those dates. Yep. Um, list of products purchased in the prior year. Um, and I'm, I guess I should specify that this is on the medical side um, because I really um, want to ensure the continuity of products and services for Vermont patients. And I say Vermont patients there um, because there's been a recommendation from the medical subcommittee to allow reciprocity for others with other state patients, and um, which I'm fine with allowing reciprocity. Um, but I do want to make sure that Vermont patients are are held harmless by increasing the number of patients that have access to the medically specific cannabis. Um, I don't want you know because. All of a sudden, we have you know, three thousand patients from other states coming in. That the the shelves are empty for Vermont patients. So I want to know what products they're purchasing from the prior year, and make sure that those products are on the shelf for the next year. Um, any any comment on that requirement? No, I think we need to ensure that Vermont patients choose to use the dispensary, get the products that they want to get regardless of if other medical state patients are coming in? Um, the plan, um, this is kind of a first year plan because it's a one-time contribution, but plan to contribute $50,000 to the Cannabis Business Development Fund by October 1st, 2022, which is when the payment is due. Um, and then uh, I think you remember uh, 
the one in the seven BSA nine hundred three. That's the criteria for um, priority of licensure review. That the first one A one was a medical uh, dispensary in good standing. So I think we need to develop some good standing criteria. I don't know what that looks like quite yet, um, but I think that we need to um, have medical dispensaries in their license show that they are in good standing. Um, and that can be that they've, you know, addressed product recalls adequately, that they met testing standards, that they, um, you know, are responsive to patient complaints, et cetera. I, I don't know exactly what that criteria will be, but I think, um, you know, we, if, you know, if the dispensaries are getting benefits, that they should have certain minimum standards that they're meeting. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. The um, contribution to the Cannabis Business Development Fund, is that something that can be ongoing as well? We talked about that in terms of the flower bullet, right, but... I don't know if we have the authority to um, make that an ongoing um, contribution, but we, we could recommend it. I would entertain the, the thought to recommend it. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's why I brought it up, obviously, right? Like, that's... <laughs> um, okay. Because what's the life of that program after year one if there's no more contributions to it? Maybe I'm just... Right. I think the idea... I mean, I know it says fun, uh, grants and loans, so I, I think the idea is it's a revolving loan fund, but not on the grant side of things, of course. So um, right. it will potentially diminish over time. Okay. All right. Let's see. So testing, of course, is kind of a big um, piece of, you know, the complaints that we've heard about the medical program uh, largely um, uh, comment accessibility and quality, and the quality side um, is on testing. So I think, you know, again, like this, this first bullet point comes, I think, from Colorado or Massachusetts, I can't quite remember, but, and I think we have this inherent authority for all license types, so just wanted to make sure that it's clear here, is that we can demand a testing um, sample, testing samples, um, and then test them um, on, on demand, essentially. Um, maintain copies of any testing um, that's been done uh, maintain copies, records of all complaints, which might include reports about quality or adverse reactions, um, have recall and corrective action procedures. And then this last one um, came out of uh, either Colorado or Massachusetts, just um, have policies in place to ensure that there are no actual or perceived um, um, conflicts of interest that undermine public's confidence. You know, these are integrated licenses. I think it's pretty clear that they're not gonna be allowed to test their own products um, because that seems to be an inherent conflict. Um, but um, I think that they should probably go beyond that and just make sure that they don't have any apparent or actual conflicts of interest just being an integrated license um, holder. So. I think third-party testing, just to sum up, is actually already required. But um, I think you know we could use this language too, just for all potential conflicts around testing. Agreed. All right. So um, this next, I've copied a portion of Act One Sixty Four. Um, it's. I forget where exactly it is, section eight, I think. Um, but it says that the cannabis plant, um, cannabis product, usable cannabis possession limits for a registered dispensary shall no longer apply after February 1st, 2022. 
a dispensary shall be permitted to cultivate cannabis and manufacture cannabis products for the purpose of transferring or selling such products to an integrated license on or after April 1st, 2022. And so the way that I read this um, is that, you know, the current medical dispensaries have plant limits. They're, um, they're allowed to grow, I think it's two mature, seven immature plants per patient that's been designated to them because all the patients have to designate a dispensary. So all of their kind of canopy limits, their plant limits are based on patient counts. And so they're saying here that after February 1st, all of those plant counts go away. They essentially are being given unlimited canopy um, and they're given the authority to transfer that canopy to the adult rec side, their integrated license side, free, freely after April 1st. So, um, you know, you, to me, there's two kind of fundamental priorities of Act 162 that this kind of cuts against. Um, I think the, first of all, I guess, I think the reason that this exists is because, you know, they get the, integrated licenses get to open their doors um, before everyone else has even put plants in the ground. So the thinking, I think, from the legislature, and I wasn't part of the debate on this section, is that there's going to be a, a huge demand and essentially no legitimate um, licensed product to sell other than from the dispensaries. So this is meant to meet the initial demands. Um, before we have our own, before the kind of small cultivators, other licensed cultivators are able to produce. But again, the two kind of priorities that I see this cutting against are one, that there's no, there's no commitment in this language that there's gonna be sufficient supply for the medical patients. You know, they're allowed to freely transfer as much as they want under this. Um, and you know they could transfer all of their canopy for instance or all of their plants um, leaving nothing left for the medical patients so there's the fear there um, and then the second one is you know we heard over and over and over again um, that we're supposed to be prioritizing small cultivators and a craft cultivation the kind of vermont scale that we're not supposed to um, I mean, I think Senator Sears' words were having big weed take over um, Vermont. Um, and so this kind of cuts against what we've been trying to do on our market structure, which is really focus on smaller cultivators to supply the demand in Vermont. Um, so this is kind of, you know, three, three kind of companies with they have the ability, they have the economies of scale, they have the infrastructure in place um, to kind of really dominate early and then kind of continue um, to dominate. So um, what I was thinking, just these are three kind of points here. Um, one that we, in order to kind of deal with this, those concerns, one, we need to keep inventory records that ensure the continuity of products for Vermont patients. Again, you know, if we have reciprocity, we have out-of-state patients, you know, I don't mind pushing those patients to the adult rec market. Um, I think that they should be allowed to use the medical product, but I wanna keep Vermont patients whole um, as a priority. Um, and so um, just ensuring inventory records that are tied to the prior year's um, kind of product list that we talked about is one of the records that they need to maintain. Um, one thing that Colorado requires is having a separate kind of seed to sale tracking um, from the outset uh, between adult use and medical use. Um, the medicinal subcommittee um, recommended not doing that, um, that they wanted to have, that the dispensary should be able to have kind of one canopy and as they start moving the plants to the kind of various um, production side um, that, they, that they designate at that point, um, not beforehand. And I actually am fine with that. I don't really see why having separate inventories so long as we're ensuring that the Vermont patients have access. Um, I don't really see what benefit we get from having just two distinct from the time of seed um, or clone ha having to designate at that point whether this plant is eventually gonna be a retail or a medical. So 
I'm actually okay with eliminating that second bullet point. So, but you're, I saying, so you're, a, you're saying they could commingle their growing operations. Right. Does that have any impact on the 25% that they're supposed to purchase from small growers? They need to have a plan to, um, they need, they, well, I think they have to ensure that 25% of their flower on the adult rec side is from small cultivators, if available, so there's a little bit of wiggle room there. But um, I don't think that that, you know, I think it's tied to the adult rec side. So I don't think that this would, Im I don't think that this would change that re requirement one way or the other. Yeah, I haven't thought through it. I just don't want to create some sort of loophole. Right. Whereby transferring inventory, then there's some confusion about what, what that 25% is. So I'm just trying to, con well, if you want to answer that question. No, I just, I, I think that we would, I think we have a responsibility as a board to ensure compliance with that 25%. Um, I don't think it, uh, I don't think, it, I don't think having separate inventories would create a loophole. I, I, so I'm just trying to conceptualize this. So like our retail license right now, we have a 25,000 tier and a 15,000 tier. So if, if an integrated license holder and they don't need to keep their growing operations separate, mm -hmm. may have a tiering structure or a canopy size that's higher than our retail right. tier. But depending on our conversation that's gonna come up on the transfer, they could only operate a certain square footage of that tier into the retail market besides transfer and a certain percentage of that can total canopy into the medical market and seed to sale tracking could help us keep track from an inventory perspective on what's being grown for what purpose. I, th I think that's right. I mean, essentially the last question is about the transfer and how we're gonna keep track. Um, so I think the what we need to decide is, um, I think there's a legitimate concern, the reason that genesis of this language I think is to address the concern that there is going to be the demand is going to far exceed supply in the initial outlay of licenses when when the door is open there's only going to be um, these integrated licenses that are able to kind of supply the market I, I understand and I, I recognize the potential need to kind of kickstart things on on right. day one I don't necessarily like the optics of an integrated license holder having, I'm throwing numbers out there, a 75,000 square foot total canopy when nobody else can have, at this point in time, a 15,000 square foot total canopy. The optics of that, even if we have indoor inventory tracking that will keep the retail from the medical separate, I just don't necessarily like the way that that looks. Well, I, I feel like, see, the, like, it says that a dispensary shall be permitted to cultivate cannabis for the purpose of transferring. I think that gives us the authority we need to <coughs> have regulations around what that transfer looks like. And so, um, you know, I don't like whether it is having a segregated amount of plants, uh, you know, canopy space, that's certainly one way to do it. Um, I think the other way to do it would be to just think about that transfer, that they have to transfer the plant to the adult rec, rec market. And they can do that through seed to sale tracking. And the amount of plants that they could transfer would be the equivalent of whatever our highest tier of right. license is at that time. Would it, would it make sense for us to come back to this in a second and talk about the transfer aspect of this? Because that might help kind of bring things into a clearer vision on how it would look from an integrated perspective on whether or not we can commingle or separate growing operations between a, a retail market and a medical market. Yeah. So the transfer, I mean, I just laid out a few options for discussion here. Yeah. Um, you know, we could allow free, just free transfer. The transfers can happen at any time, any amount. We could have a capped transfer, which would be more in line with kind of what we're talking about, which is just, and maybe only at designated intervals or only as approved by the board that would ensure that whatever that transfer is, it would be the equivalent of, it wouldn't be over 
whatever our highest tier license is at that time. And I say at that time because we might never open up the 25,000 right. square foot license. Um, and so if our highest license was a 15,000, then they would be capped at transferring only the equivalent of 15,000 square feet of plants to the adult use side. So I think, you know, and, and this language can be read any one of a number of ways, you know, right. and I think that's why there's a lot of questions and thoughts and concerns about what this actually indicates. I think generally I recognize the need for a potential transfer to happen on, on day one because nobody will be licensed right. in being able to prop propagate, cultivate, harvest, everything else product to meet the statutory requirement of April 1st. And I think we should maintain some control over when transfers happen thereafter because we might find ourselves in a situation where our current supply cannot meet demand. Right. But I think having free transfer at any given time is a non-starter for me. I think um, I think all transfers would need required approval by us, but I think we should maintain uh, control over when those transfers happen by doing so at designated intervals that are determined yeah. by us and allowed by us. So transfers require approval and they can happen at designated intervals. I mean, um, I'm fine with that recommendation, of course. You know, it was one of my suggestions here, but um, uh, yeah, I, I think that's what, I, I honestly think that's the direction we should go, but I recognize that people do need to make some sort of business decisions on these things. So um, I, uh, I would say we make that our recommendation and take public comment on it and see, how, see what the response is. Yeah, I mean, I just, I, I would agree there. I just, I'm, I'm anxious about how the integrated license is get every advantage that we have been trying to level the playing field and this this on free transfer or not maintaining control of that transfer is not something I'm in favor of. I would like to hear public comment on it at some point. Um, but you know it kind of gets back to the optics of this and keeping inventory separate and I, I'm okay with I guess co-mingling those gr that grow up operation and not requiring them to be a separate physical right. location but I need guarantees that the inventory or seat to sale tracking can help us keep track that nothing is being diverted from the medical program working around what we're trying to accomplish with these transfer caps into the recreational market by the integrated license holders yeah I think I think we're all Julie is do you want to comment uh, I'm in agreement with that line of thinking I go back and forth about the inventories for adult use and medical use only because, I mean, um, I'm wondering if there are, like for medical patients, is, are there more restrictions on the way that something is grown? You know, are the, are the sanitary restrictions a little bit higher than, than the adult use when you know that it could be going to a patient that's immunocompromised? So I, I guess that's the only- Or the applications that are used in growing it. Yeah, or what, what is something that you're putting, I, I just wonder about the difference in how something's grown for adult use versus medical use. And it, I don't know that it's hugely different, but I think there are it, there's possibly some difference. Uh, the other pieces in terms of the capping the transfer or um, you know having designated, I, I'm in line with that thinking. I'm not comfortable with freely transferring, but I, I think having some controls um, is a good recommendation. So to give kind of these dispensaries or these integrated license holders some, um, you know, uh, predictability, do we want to have a capped transfer so they know what the maximum is and have designated intervals so they know when they can do the transfer and then they yeah. further would require board approval? Uh, yes, I'd be comfortable with that. So then just remove the freely transfer. And with that cap transfer, what are we capping it at? Is that something to be determined? Or is it we're starting at 15,000 as our highest indoor retail limit? So if we start there, I, I'm, I, my only concern is we don't know what demand's going to be on day one. Right. So capping it could be a double-edged 
<coughs> sword, you know what I mean? Right. And I, I don't necessarily have a, a better, I know in Colorado they allowed you to do a one-time free transfer of everything you wanted at an added inception, and then you couldn't do any transfers after that. <coughs> and I don't necessarily like that model, but how can we just ensure that we can meet demand, and what's the appropriate cap, I guess is my question. Is there a best of both worlds where it's capped except for a request? Well, we could have a cap, and then we could have a request to like exceed the cap. Right. I don't know if we need a cap then. That's why I was thinking just designated intervals determined by us and required approval by us, which gives us right. the most control. I get that it's harder to make a business decision, but I'm, I'm most concerned with integrated operators playing at the same level field as our other indoor cultivators yeah and then when do we want this provision to kick in because I do think that the again that the that the fear that this was a designed to address is a real one um, I do think that there will be a demand shock or whatever we want to call it initially that um, that the integrated licenses are able to um, accommodate uh, and noting that they will be getting 25% of their flower from cultivators, small cultivators. So when would they be able to do the, the we, transfer? So I think they're kind of like Colorado, you said they're allowed a one-time transfer, um, but then we're going to limit it for further transfers. When um, do we want to do a one-time transfer initially and then limit it, like have these other provisions that we have to approve the transfers? Or should we just have us approve the transfers the whole time? If you allow a one-time transfer, could they, could they transfer all their inventory and shut down their medical side? I mean, I think, and maybe I've missed a piece of what you said. Well, I think- I don't- they, they, I think under this first provision would have to keep records to ensure the continuity of products. So are you proposing that they could do an unlimited transfer this spring and then after that it would only happen determined by us? Is that what you're saying? I mean, or we could just be in charge of all of them. I mean, we could just re require our approval for all of them. I think... Um, I guess my, my thought is I'd, I'd rather, and I know that this makes it more difficult on the integrated license holder, but that's not at the top of my priority list when it comes to me having my own concerns. I'd like for them to give us information on as to what, why they need to transfer a certain total canopy size amount into the regulated market to meet anticipated demand on day one. So then what I would say in response to that is that we could require approval of all transfers, but at this initial stage, and we don't know how long that initial stage is gonna be, it's not gonna be at designated intervals. So they could say we need to transfer the equivalent of 25,000 <laughs> square feet of canopy to meet our initial demand, and then in three months, if that's not at a designated interval time, they might need to come back to us and say, uh, we need to transfer a little bit more, and then they have to have some justification for it. And okay. we'll have seed to sale tracking, so we'll know in point of sale tracking, so we'll know whether they're kind of, if there's a discrepancy between what they're asking. Yeah, I'm cool with that, and, and uh, yeah, the designated interval thing seems a little arbitrary because we don't necessarily know. I just like right. that system that we're saying, okay, this is when you can submit right. a request for a transfer, more so than us determining right now, every three months you can request one or something along those lines. You know what I'm, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? So, I'm with that. so do we want to leave out designated intervals altogether, or is that? <laughs> um, I don't know what's a better Basically way to kind of. What we're talking about is all require approval by the CCB. My sort of next question is though: is do we want that forever, or just for the first three years, or do we want to have to revisit this at some? I mean, I assume we'll revisit most of these in future years. I don't think we put a time stamp on it right now. Okay. Yeah. I don't think we do time stamp it for now. I want to maintain control of this just to, so we can maintain continuity for medical patients and just know that there's not these free, overly 
aggressive transfers going on. I, I want to know the reasoning as to why a transfer is being requested and you know some some business information to back up why it needs to happen. Okay. So, Bryn, did you catch that? You know, I'm not sure. I think I think <laughs> I think if we're going to do all transfers approved, require approval, then you can eliminate separate inventories and you can eliminate freely transfer cap transfer and designated interval transfer. Okay. Got it. All right. Do we need to further discuss at all the separate in inventory? I mean, we can. We are going to get a recommendation from the medical committee, but um, I can tell you that that's on there, so we can talk about it now. Um, what was the recommendation? The recommendation was to allow co-mingling. No, you designate whether where it's going at a much later point in the supply chain, not at the grow, not when you're growing. I think my concerns kind of lie with what Julie kind of said is, you know, recognizing medical patients are doing this for a different purpose than just recreational use and the inputs that could be used for rec versus medical and and you know every everything else I'm just I'm curious how other states have kind of grappled with this maybe I'm just not as familiar with the software we're going to be using to have a hundred percent trust in it but in my mind I'm thinking I'd be more comfortable with two separate grow operations it could be in the same building but to have two separate square square footage, you know, total canopy tiers, one for medical and one. So the medical side could be unlimited though, right? By statute, yeah, the, yeah. the plan counts were removed, but they would only be able to, to transfer that product to the recreational market from, that was grown from that medical canopy at our, at our approval, right? Yeah, I don't know why they would need to do that necessarily if we're saying you're capped at this amount, you know, like you're capped at 25,000 square feet, let's just say if we have that license type open, why are they further, why are we giving them some advantage to further transfer medical product to the, that's an advantage that no one else would have at that point. I, I mean, I think I'm agreeing with you and I think we're just kind of getting lost in the different options that are on the table. I'm just saying, like, if the market isn't, let's say that we're not getting buy-in from small cultivators that we hope to, to get. And so we have that 25,000 cap recognizing that we have all these other outdoor cultivation tiers and lower indoor cultivation tiers that we're hoping are satisfying the market. So, like, let's say we need more total canopy. And even if we have that highest 25,000 square foot canopy, we can't meet demand. And then they could potentially at that point i'm just I'm, I'm doomsday scenarioing it right now but you know i just don't think if we require a totally separate inventory for medical use that they're going to grow well above their capacity for the patients you know so there's not going to be this like stockpile of reserve medical canopy that's that they're going to then be able to transfer freely to meet the adult use demand no i understand that in the practicality i'm just i'm i could be persuaded to have inventories grown the same if we can guarantee that the seed to sale tracking will not divert any medical to the recreational market without us knowing i'm just i'm just concerned that they i want to make sure that they're playing by the retail i would say part of the, the transfer approval process would be this kind of continuity of products like that there's sufficient supply for vermont patients uh before we approve any transfer Can you, um, Pepper, which group made the, that recommendation? The to yeah, it was the medicinal sub subcommittee. It was supported by, I mean, the only two people in the room were, uh, I think, Jim and uh, Meg, and then Matt Myers from the Department of Health, the, you know, the designee for Dr. Levine. I guess I'd like to, I, I'd like to hear public comment on that piece, particularly from patients. Okay. Me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I think one of the benefits that they discussed, and, I, and you know, I'm not, I, I think it makes sense for them to be able to co-mingle. Um, but one of the things that they said is, you know, they're going to be growing a variety of strains for the adult use market. Um, whereas currently for the medical market, because the 
patient count are so low, they really only grow like one indica, one sativa, and that's pretty much it. And so like this, by co-mingling, you know, the medical patients also will have a much larger variety, you know, because it's servicing the adult use market. Yeah. It makes sense. It just, it, I just want safeguards in place that nothing's transferred without our informed understanding and approval. You know, yeah. I'm thinking through ways in my head to give myself and hopefully the rest of us the, the most sense well, of security that yeah. happens. Well, I would suggest that we take it out, but leave it on for discussion because, you know, we can always add, but if we have vote on leaving it in for now, then it seems to me that we're voting to have that be part of the discussion. I think it's easier to add something later than it is to remove something, but maybe I'm wrong. I understand. So Wait, which part are we, so I'm sorry, I've gotten a little lost. Which part are we talking about removing just, and just talking this, about later? Just the separate inventories. Okay. Yes, I think that's fine. I, I think we'll, we will hear or should hear public comment on it, and, and I agree with you. We could add it back later if we yeah. hear that that's not um, helpful to patients. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to power through because we have a break at 1245, and I don't really have a lot to say about merit-based scoring. Um, So just once again, um, putting up the criteria for a review on um, what we need to be considering for priority. I had a um, long conversation with Jen um, Flanagan from Massachusetts. She um, strongly opposes merit-based scoring systems. Um, that she said that they immediately invite litigation and um, you know, once one person is disadvantaged over another person because of some score, that it turns into um, just endless amounts of justification on our end as to why we made decisions the way we did, public records requests, uh, kind of looking at everything, every little kind of aspect of, of why we gave a point here and not a point there, et cetera. Um, she also suggested that after our initial outlay of licenses, um, that the priority system has very little value. Um, you know, they weren't receiving new applications. It's such a like steady clip that um, the that the priority system had any value after their kind of initial round of licensing. I think I voiced that concern. Yeah. Already. Right. Um, she looked. I showed her this list, and she said it's a good list. You know, and these are the things that we should be considering. Um, she just doesn't think we should have a specific point system for for these things. We should have essentially minimum standards for each. And if you don't meet the minimum standards, um, then we uh, we don't reject the application, but we send it back to the applicant and ask for more information on some of these criteria. And again, if the application is not um, if the kind of request for more information is not responded to in a timely manner, then that application then moves down um, the queue. So Massachusetts just did not move the, the queue. They had a, you know, a time stamp on every application as to when it was uh, complete and submitted. And they did not move anyone in priority except in three circumstances. So they always moved, they had a bucket at the top of the pile, at the top of the queue for social equity applicants. And so those got moved to the top in the order that they were received. Um, but they were, those, those were always the, the first priority. Um, the second priority is they had a category of economic empowerment candidates. Um, I think this would be more akin to our um, DEI candidates that we're considering, um, but that was kind of uh, the next bucket down in priority. And those were, you know, if an e economic empowerment applicant came through, application came through, that those got moved to the kind of second tier of priority in the order that they were received. So you know, you think if uh, you know on 
you know, October 1st, we have a social equity or an economic empowerment or DEI application that comes in. And then on October 2nd, we have a social equity applicant that comes in. You know, that social equity would be in front of the economic empowerment or DEI one, but then the DEI one would come in next over the rest of the general applications that we have. Um, and then they did make some considerations Jen had a few examples or at least one example of when they had to really think about the demands of the market and move people in priority based upon or move people around in the queue based upon the needs of the market so you know she was talking about they did not have any testing labs that they had licensed and they had already licensed you know a number of cultivators so they had to move um, some testing facilities and I think that's going to be important for us as well to have a um, a way to evaluate maybe just the, the overall supply chain. You know, if we've had 50 cultivators that are licensed and no testing facilities, product manufacturers, or retail outlets, then where is that product going to go once it's harvested? Um, so consider the needs of the supply chain. Have some consideration of geographic need, I think would be important. You know, I, I just think that. Um, if we don't have access at all points of the supply chain all around the state, that there, that could present additional problems as well. Um, and then to me, I think, I can't remember the exact language, but I think we are also, we should potentially have some ability to move the queue for small cultivators. That, you know, if a small cultivator application comes in, you know, um, that it, it gets some sort of priority as well. But again, I. I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm not fully, I haven't fully thought through whether that's essential to, to our review process. I agree with you on the essential part, but I would like for us to figure out a way to make that accommodation for small cultivators if we yeah. can. They're going, they're going to go first, I should say. You know, by statute, they're gonna go first. But um, I'm just thinking like, you know, six months down the line, if we have, you know, 100 general applications and then a small cultivator comes in, do we want to move that small cultivator to the top behind the social equity and if we do DEI? Anyway, it's just a topic of conversation. I don't think this is, of course, an area where we will receive I think a lot of public comment, and it's the area where we open ourselves up towards kind of a wave of litigation slash Public Records Act requests. So I think we shouldn't jump the gun on uh, approving anything right now, but I think we should really think about, think through how we want to do this. Um, I do have just a few, I just included a few examples from um, Massachusetts about they're, they're part of their application, you have to have a <coughs> plan to positively impact disproportionately harm people. Um, and this is what they required there. And then they had a, as part of their application process, you had to have a diversity plan as well. And, you know, Jen said, you know, they would reject people for not being specific enough on this. Um, you know, she had a number of things that she would reject people for, but, um, uh, and I, when I say reject, she'd send the application back because they wouldn't deny based upon not having one of these, but they would send back for more information. Um, did she, did yeah. she say how this worked out, the, the percentages? Sometimes um, programs like this where it's percentage-based is, can be more harmful than helpful. Yeah, so I did ask her about, um, I didn't ask her that specific question. Um, so I, I'd be curious, and, and maybe Julie, you wanna follow up with her. Um, yeah. I did ask about compliance though, because this is of course an application and you know people can make all promises they want and we're granting them their license based upon those promises. And you know they might not actually ever fulfill them. And she said that was happening and sometimes through no intention of the applicant 
but some, you know, some organizations, some nonprofits, they had this kind of like, you have to donate a certain amount of money um, to certain organizations, certain nonprofits, and the nonprofits were not accepting money from cannabis outlets, so they were not fulfilling some of their promises. Um, and uh, so sh they started requiring like letters pre like pre approval from nonprofits that you were going to donate to um, to ensure that they wouldn't run into those issues. But you know that's kind of non intentional non compliance. You know, the intentional non-compliance are kind of what I am more concerned with. Um, and so I talked to her about that as well. You know, we can impose fines. We're allowed to impose fines on organizations. We can kind of suspend licenses. It's pretty extreme. But um, I do think that we should, if we're going to require things like this, we should really think about the enforcement of them as well. Um, the only other kind of decision or discussion point that I wanted to bring up today on the licensing review, because I think, again, we need to have a deeper conversation about how we're going to do this, um, is this, number, this first criteria, whether the applicants have an existing medical cannabis dispensary license in good standing. And um, the question that came up, and of course, when this was being drafted, we, you know, no one knew if we were going to have residency requirements or anything like that for applicants. You know, the question that I want to pose to you, Julie and Kyle, is whether having an existing medical dispensary in another state should have any bearing on our criteria here, or if this really is just Vermont-based dispensaries that we're talking about. Do we have the ability to to limit out-of-state dispensaries? Or we've had a lot of conversations about interstate commerce. Well, I think there's a difference between not letting them submit an application and giving them a priority. Right. And I don't. I didn't read this with any thought <laughs> related to that. I was thinking about the current Vermont medical. Right. And but at the same time, what's the point if they're all going to pursue an integrated license? anyways right? right so I was struggling to kind of see the value in in number one maybe there will be a medical dispensary that doesn't go for an integrated license though don't right. think that's what I've heard but so are you are you saying that's yes. kind of and not understanding the residency requirements at the time it was drafted is that kind of what you think was the intent here I I think the intent really was about Vermont medical dispensaries getting a leg up um, in priority review, um, but uh, I um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's an open question. Um, but if we're not going to move the queue around at all, um, then I'm not sure whether you know. If we're not going to move the queue around at all, if unless you failed to meet minimum standards that we create for these things, then. Um, I'm not sure that number one matters, whether it's in-state or out-of-state. Right. I think you're right, Pepper, that this is a, a much more in-depth conversation that we need to kind of keep returning to. Yep. Agreed. Sorry about that, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, why don't we... Um, what do you all want to do? Should we pause for public comment now? Should we pause for a break? Julie still needs to present her slides. Oh, sorry, Julie. Oh my God. <laughs> um, we are out of Yeah. Time. Do you, well, is the public comment on the agenda for now? Um, no, we we have it uh, for two o'clock. So I'm happy to go through my slides now or after the break. Um, I don't have the agenda. I say we muscle. But. Okay. Is everyone okay. out of that? David, Brent's probably good. Nelly, Steve. <laughs> All right, we'll we'll uh, we'll muscle through. Okay. You need to unplug yourself. You need to unplug yourself first. Okay. So, um, I'm gonna keep. Uh, talking about packaging uh, and labeling to start with, I've just included, you know, as I always do, the pieces of the mission I think um, 
are relevant. And then I also included for the folks at home, the kind of baseline recommendations that we went over on the 27th. And then, um, so to, to make the considerations around packaging, I reviewed the hemp rules, um, thinking about some of the, the things that are required in labeling specifically. Um, a lot of this came from conversation in the public health subcommittee and with the members of the public health subcommittee, certainly the requirements that we have in statute, um, a review of guidelines in other states, and then you know ongoing conversations with um, Bryn and David NICB, and then just a reminder that some of the things that are proposed will need to um, also go to the Department of Health for their consideration as well. Um, so I've included the the uh, the statute uh, related to cultivator packaging because it says packaging shall. I didn't repeat any of of these shall shall do items when I um, sort of listed the additional things that we would ask cultivators to do. So these are the things that we already know that they must include in their packaging. Um, and it, when it's sold to a wholesaler or a product manufacturer or to another cultivator, in addition to those um, shall include items, packaging should also include um, you know, all of those appropriate baseline packaging recommend recommendations that we talked about um, and harvest date. So the um, statute requires, I think, produced on, um, which is defined as, you know, when the, the finished product is, is done. Um, and I think the harvest date should be on there as well in case there's a delay between, or to, to show the delay between harvest and um, finished production. Um, and I think, you know, kind of a discussion point that we should have is should there be um, any kind of testing results on that packaging or access to the testing results? I think when product goes from a cultivator to anywhere else, you know, that any kind of testing results would go with it as a file at least. But should it be um, signified somewhere on the packaging is the discussion point I think that we should have. Um, and then when it's sold to a finished, uh, a retailer as a finished product, all of the appropriate baseline packaging, of course, and then all of the retail packaging requirements that we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, moving on to manufacturer packaging. Uh, again, I just include the statute just for reference. Um, for consumables, um, a finished product from a manufacturer should have all of those baseline packaging requirements and should not um, you know, include the use of toys or inflatables, all of the, the same sort of language that we used in advertising. Um, I've specifically spelled out here, shouldn't appeal to, to minors under the age of 21, um, should have a use by or best by date, which um, I have some information from NACB on this and I need to get a little bit more before I'm comfortable making any kind of recommendations related to that. Um, they also need to include the number of servings in the package, not to exceed five milligrams, the strain variety and THC content, um, the total number of, of servings within the package, and a note um, that, that tells the consumer um, how long it could take for, um, to, for the consumption of it to take effect. And then, of course, um, again, some sort of access to the test results, whether it's a QR code or a web address, and we have a requirement that um, manufacturers and retailers and cultivators have those on their websites, that's something we can discuss down the road. Um, for things that are not consumable, so I'm, in this regard, I thought of things that are generally topical, um, you know, we'd want to have all of those baseline requirements again, and then anything used in production, scents, additives, common irritants, things like keep away from eyes, um, and a notice that the product is not for consumption. For retail packaging, um, there's already some shells, so I did not, I did not, you know, reiterate those in my recommendations. We already know that those are things that are required. So for retail packaging, they must follow all of the baseline requirements that we talked about on the 27th, um, and all of the finished products. Uh, requirements that we've just talked about for the manufacturer. 
and um, then exit packaging in a retailer uh, must be sealed or stapled and must not appeal to minors. So any kind of exit bag or packaging can't have um, you know, anything that appeals to under 21 has to follow those same sort of uh, advertising recommendations that we've talked about before. And then, of course, integrated packaging should follow all of the appropriate packaging for whatever license type we're talking about. Manufacturers would have to follow the manufacturing piece and so on and so forth. So under general retail operations, um, you know, for the rules related to general retail operations, for product placement in a retail store, um, products that contain THC and meet the definition of cannabis have to be displayed behind a locking barrier. That barrier can certainly be transparent. Um, packaging can be on display. So if a retailer wanted to have, um, you know, a nice looking display in their store, they could do that so long as the packaging doesn't contain any product. Any actual product would have to be behind a barrier of some kind. Um, and, you know, considering the deli style conversation that we had earlier, I think that's still accomplishable. Behind a barrier could also be behind, well, I, I think I've included here a locking barrier, but it still could be behind a counter locking barrier that's glass um, and could be seen through. And I think you could still accomplish, Kyle, the same thing that we talked about earlier. Yeah, it's like if you go to like a jewelry store and you're like, I want to see that one and they unlock it. And right. That's what I was thinking. Um, and then products that contain THC and meet the definition of cannabis can be sold in the same location um, as products that meet the definition of hemp or non-hemp products. So, uh, T-shirts, stickers, things like that, but they have to be displayed separately. Um, and then we've already had the conversation about uh, the locking barrier and being able to remove it for uh, and, and inspect prior to purchase. I think if we're going to talk about the difference between, if we're going to talk about deli style packaging, the other thing we may want to consider talking about is, you know, if we if we don't do that, or even if we do, can a product be opened and like a pre-packaged product be opened and then resealed? I have some public health concerns about that. Um, I don't know that we want to allow, you know, sealed packages to be opened, inspected, and then resealed. I think I'd prefer the deli style conversation that we had earlier. You mean where somebody has like a sample jar that they can look at but still receive like that same strain and that same harvest allotment so on and so forth um, yes yep or selecting from that kind of bulk section you know meat large mason jar whatever it is and selecting something for purchase i'm okay with that too i'm thinking you know if you have something that's um Prepackaged. I'm not as comfortable with opening that prepackaged item, inspecting the prepackaged item, putting it back in the package, and then having it still be for sale if someone chooses not to buy it. So you're thinking maybe more so in the edible or concentrate world where you're kind of opening the pop top and looking at your gummies and then saying, nah, I don't want this. Yeah, I, I'm not as comfortable with that. And it, it could be even with flour. Flour is prepackaged in some way. Um, if a retailer decides not to do that deli style packaging, but does prepackaged flour, you know, I would prefer that deli style that we were talking about over opening a package and then resealing it. So if you're looking at just a package of an eighth, for example, um, I think it's better to have that deli style packaging that you were talking about, Kyle, than being able to open up that eighth, look at it and buy it. But I could be wrong. I think, um, and and some of this is my own personal, um, you know, coming from a food background and thinking about, you know, how we handle food and whether or not we want food handled by others before we serve it. Um, you know, I certainly we can have a conversation about whether or not the packaging could be opened and resealed. I think that makes sense. I mean, it's all about, you know, my perspective is all about preference. Some folks might feel a little differently regarding deli style or pre opening a prepackaged product and then others would. Some might be comfortable with just saying, hey, I like this, I want it. 
regardless of whether or not somebody else has opened it, you know, other right. folks might err more on the side of how you you think. But I think, you know, I agree with that. And I think the deli style um, would be the way for us to move this this kind of aspect forward. Okay. I agree. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the POS flyer. So every retailer should have this a, a point of sale flyer that will create and offer it to every customer. Um, and then we're supposed to have it on our website as well. Um, so it should be in multiple languages. It should be online. There should be a QR code uh, for accessibility. Uh, there should be a text to speech option. Um, you know, an easy to understand language. Um, when I looked at the versions of this in other states, the best ones had some sort of graphic, uh, infographic style format so that um, it was really easy to find a particular piece of information on the on the on the flyer that you were looking for, whether it was time for consumption or uh, effects or something like that. So and we should offer a visually appealing version that's poster sized if people want to have that in their in their retail locations. Um, I could definitely foresee someone walking into a location and seeing that and and being able to look at it uh, versus just having it as a as a flyer that's handed out. Um, and so it needs to contain the methods for consuming cannabis safely and responsibly, um, avoiding birds and other safety hazards, proper storage, uh, proper disposal, how to avoid overconsumption. Um, the potential health risks, signs of impairment, uh, resources for mental health, general health, and substance abuse. You know what to do if you feel that you've overconsumed, or if you're um, if you're feeling the effects of cannabis and it's not what you've expected. It and how to avoid or talk to how to avoid um, ha having it move to youth in the home, and then also you know how how to talk to youth or resources on how to talk to youth. And it should be. Um, created with the assumption that the person receiving this flyer has already chosen to consume cannabis. So when we get to the point of actually looking at or drafting language, um, however that happens, it should be done with the assumption that somebody's already chosen to consume and that we're not trying to guilt them now that they've already made that um, choice. Makes sense. Um, and so the last piece I'll talk about is additives. Um, we have some legislation around additives um, and what can be added to cannabis. So what I um, am proposing is that chemicals other than those allowed in the processing of cannabis and cannabis products would not be added. So no additional psychoactive materials or anything that's not naturally occurring. Um, and then no characterizing flavors, which is actually part of the, the legislation anyway, and then or, or adding sweeteners. And I've added except for those for sale for, to medical patients. And the reason I added that is what I understand is that there are folks who are in some type of palliative care or children who have severe um, seizures that are um, given medical cannabis and then but are only able to consume it when there's an added flavor because they're they have a hard time with the taste of cannabis alone. Um, maybe some of those things can be added to edibles for those folks, but maybe they can't. And so I left in a piece about uh, for medical patients only because um, I think in those cases, the the illness is severe enough um, that an, a an characterizing flavor is probably not going to be the thing that causes any further health impairment to the person. But I would like to hear public comment on that. Um, and this is all to say that not, and I added this little note just for clarity, it's not to say that you can't add ca cannabis to something that's sweet, it's that you can't add a sweetener to the cannabis. Um, and I think that that, as quickly as I can, are all of my slides for today. I did wonder if there are specific chemicals or toxins or sweeteners that we needed to identify. I don't think so. Um, but I would certainly take your your thoughts on that. And I know that there are additives that are, I mean, they're not additives necessarily, but there are sweeteners that are used in cultivation. I also don't think we need to specifically call that out because I think in this particular case, we're talking about like finished products. 
Yeah. I don't think we need to prescribe at yeah. this point. Yeah. I did have, I did have a, uh, just circling back to some of your discussion points, Julia, I just want to mm -hmm. make sure I understand the QR code thing. Um, and should we pr prescribe that a QR code needs to be on packaging? Um, was that in, staring at myself in multiple ways right now. Julie, you're still sharing the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was distracting to stare at myself in <laughs> a couple of different screens. Um, were you suggesting that, and I know you left it as, as a discussion point, so I don't think you were suggesting anything, but just for the sake of making sure I understand, in addition to a relevant information on a label, also putting on a QR code or putting on a QR code in place of a full suite of information that I'm going to refer to it as, um, you know, not all the information, but but more information be found on the QR code or I just I'm trying to tease out what you were thinking. So um, are you talking about for the cultivator packaging? Or yeah, I think I, saw it in, I think I saw it in a couple different um, parts of your presentation. I just want to make sure I understand what you're thinking. So my thought on having a QR code for multiple different things is that if you lose the piece of paper or there is some question, it there's there's always a QR code on the packaging that can be scanned and and send you to the information. So if the if the label gets destroyed in some way or if part of the label gets destroyed in some way or if we wanted to have testing information be available, certainly you can't put that on the whole package. Um, but you could have a QR code that sends you to the testing information and that could be for any product it, and, and, and anywhere in the supply chain. So there are some. Um, retail products that I saw samples of that had the QR code and it would send you to a website with the testing and you know where it was grown and for more information than you could include on a on a label. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's information that at least a certain segment of our consumers would like to see and have. My only question is how I'm not one that's really developed my own QR codes. Um, even given the state of the world these days, I don't know how overly burdensome it is to develop a QR code that links to that specific information on a on a per product basis. So it could just be a web address, right? And you could feel, feel you see your main page or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes that makes sense, and I'm sure folks can easily figure out. I'm just not familiar with that world <laughs> of how you would get back to your specific kind of like COA or whatever um would be provided on all the full panel testing that's been done and you know so on and so forth um i don't know how overly burdensome that is for for folks to produce yeah i had a, a question about it as well you know certain products are going to be tested at multiple points along the supply chain and you certainly don't want to have multiple qr codes on there i don't think maybe we do um but you know what i think that this to make it less burdensome for the potential licensee. I think we should tie this discussion into our seed to sale tracking slash, um, you know, th that conversation with our the kind of people that have responded to our RFI to see if this is a possibility where we, you know, because we're going to have all the testing records. So this mm -hmm. could be a link link to our site where you could then enter kind of maybe the product number or whatever you're holding and see the testing records through our portal potentially. I like I like I that. Was, My yeah. goal is access. I don't have a particular prescriptive idea about how that access happens so long as it's accessible. But I do think that the other um, health warnings and all the rest of that should be available on demand too, just like you said, at the label or you lose the point of sale flyer, like we should be able to be able to have a link to that as well. Or maybe if we have one link or one QR code, it could bring you to both. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Well, Julie, are you all right with a half hour break? Yes, I am. Thank you. All right. Everyone else here okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right, so um, it's one o'clock. Let's come back here at one thirty. All right. So uh, this is James Pepper, chair of the Cannabis Control Board. Um, it's one thirty-one p.m. 
um, on the 29th of October, and we're going to get going again. Um, next on the agenda is to review and discuss. Julie, are you with us? Sorry. Why don't we give Julie just a minute? Sure. Yeah, you need to vote on your recommendations today, too. Yeah, I was going to do There's Julie. November 1st, subcommittee review, public comment, then vote. Great. Is that all right? Yep. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Um, so, next on our list on the agenda is to review and discuss our November 1st report. Um, just by way of background, the legislature asked us to make uh, recommendations on a few topics. Our exploratory subcommittee met to discuss those topics. They made recommendations to us. We've sent them to the full advisory committee um, to review and provide comment. And um, we're going to take a look at the kind of report now, and then um, hopefully we can vote on this and our just general recommendations from our conversation earlier after a public comment period. So, Bryn, I'll turn things over to you if you want to help sure. us. Okay. So, um, this report is the third in a series of reports um, that the legislature gave to us, assigned to us for the fall. Um, and it's about, we're, we're making three separate recommendations here. So, I'm just going to pop through these first slides that talk about um, our process. So you can see our recommendations are regarding the solid concentrate products that are above 60% THC concentration, the conversion of hemp or CBD to Delta 9 THC, and then some recommendations regarding the advisory entity for our medical cannabis program. So these slides will look familiar. This is some background on, on the process. Um, here's our 14 member advisory committee. Um, created to assist in the board's mission to safely, equitably, and effectively implement the laws enabling adult medical cannabis use. Here are our subcommittees from the advisory committee. And there's just a note here that the two subcommittees that participated in the development of this report, of the recommendations that are in this report, are the Medicinal Cannabis Subcommittee and the Exploratory Subcommittee. A little name drop of our consultants here. Um, and then here are some fun facts about um, how much work we've been doing. There's a, has been 23 full board meetings since um, the end of May, three full advisory committee meetings and over 65 subcommittee meetings. And a note that we reserve time um, for public comment at all of these meetings. Um, and we also have a process set up to receive public comment through our website and we've re received more than 125 substantive public comments to date. And a note that we emphasize that um, we emphasize receiving input and feedback from both our advisory committee and the public and the development of our recommendations. So here are um, the, the requirements that are set forth in Act 62 um, that are the genesis of this report. So you can just see the language here. The first is whether certain licensees should be permitted to produce solid concentrate products with greater than 60% THC for purposes of incorporation into other cannabis products that otherwise comply with the prohibited product statute. And secondly, recommendations that um, the board develops in consultation with the Agency of Agriculture as to whether the board should permit hemp or CBD to be converted to Delta 9. And then the third um, directive that um, we respond to in this report is um, regarding updating the structure uh, and mission of the advisory entity um, that oversees the medical program in Vermont. So that's the, those are the pieces of language from Act 62. So next, we, I've, we've defined a few terms here um, because we use these terms um, throughout the recommendations. So we use the definitions of cannabinoid, Delta 9 THC, distillate, and isolate that come from the Vermont Hemp Program rules to help our readers understand the recommendations. So I'm going to jump now into the first recommendation, which is regarding the solid concentrates. 
So the board is recommending that cannabis licensees be permitted to produce extractions with a concentration of 60% or greater THC for purposes of incorporation into other cannabis products that otherwise comply with the prohibited product statute. And our rationale for this recommendation is set forth here um, from a consumer safety perspective and a financial perspective. So um, as we know, when THC is extracted from cannabis, uh, the resulting Concentrate is by nature above 60% THC. And using a full concentration extraction allows the product manufacturers to more precisely calibrate how much THC is actually going into a product. So if these, um, if these products, if these uh, concentrates above 60% are prohibited at any point in the supply chain, then producers are, producers are going to need to adulterate them. Um, to dilute the THC content before the extraction can be added to a cannabis product. And as a result, you know, cutting a natural concentrate with an additive could make the end product more dangerous as these adulterants can be potentially harmful to consumers. And then second, the financial impact is um, that, you know, licensees, there's going to be increased costs to licensees in the form of additional testing, and formulation requirements that could be imposed for any adulterants that um, are used to dilute the concentration of the extraction. And the board talked about this a little bit today at the end of Julie's presentation about additives and how, um, how little we know about them at the moment. I'm just going to keep powering through unless I get, unless. No, I please go ahead. Okay. So the second um, recommendation is uh, is uh, also about these <clears throat> high concentration products. So in accordance with uh, existing law, 7 BSA 904A, subsection A, which specifically provides that it's the intent of the General Assembly to move as much of the illegal cannabis market as possible into the regulated market for the purposes of consumer protection and public safety. The board is making a recommendation that these solid concentrates with a THC concentration of 60% or above should be removed from the prohibited products list so that the board can regulate the manufacture and sale of these products. Our rationale set forth here, um, these products are used right now. They're widely available in out-of-state markets. So um, not regulating them is going to allow the unregulated market for them to thrive. So leaving them outside of the CCB's control could be um, dangerous or harmful for both the manufacturers and the users. Some of these concentrates um, on the unregulated market are made with different kinds of solvents, and some of those solvents can pose health risks if they're either used improperly or if they're consumed at high levels. Consumers um, using them from the unregulated market might be unaware of the potential risks involved in consuming high concentrate THC and also unregulated market facilities that aren't inspected or permitted are operating at an increased risk, including, including by poten posing potential harm for first responders. So if they were brought under the board's authority, um, the manufacture and sale of these products would be subject to standards, um, a, a, an array of standards, including facility inspection, fire and building safety code, standards regarding solvent usage and extraction, standards regarding the presence of any residual solvents in the resulting product, consumer education, additional health warnings, all of these um, would come into play if these were regulated products which would result in a safer process for manufacturers and ultimately cleaner and safer products for users. So I suggest that we um, go through the entire report and save our discussion for after. Okay. So I'll move on to the third recommendation, which is regarding the conversion of hemp or CBD to Delta 9. So, um, our recommendation here that we have developed in consultation with our partners at the Agency of Agriculture is that um, our the CCB's cannabis program encompass um, the regulation of the manufacture and sale of products that contain Delta 8, Delta 9, other deltas, 
and any future um, synthetic cannabinoids with similar properties, whether they're derived from hemp or from high THC cannabis. And our rationale here is that like any product um, with intoxicating properties, these substances should be subject to regulatory control to ensure that they're only sold to people who are authorized to purchase them and that they're properly labeled, tested, packaged, and they are safe for consumers and patients. Um, so again, uh, just we're saying that we should, the, C, the CCB should be um, regulating the synthesis of Delta-9 or any other cannabinoid with similar properties. And in regulating them, we would, the board is proposing to create a license category for hemp producers who intend to synthesize these products and create a product registration process. So that prior to the release of any new product that contains an intoxicating cannabinoid, that's been synthesized from hemp. Uh, the board would first review the packaging, label, ingredients, test results, and then either approve or deny the release of that product. And then moving into our final recommendation about the medical cannabis advisory entity. Um, this is the recommendation regarding the membership of the entity. So. Um, the recommendation that is that it be comprised of 12 members, six registered patients um, chosen by the board from a list of volunteers from the, from the patient registry. And the criteria should include geographical location, socioeconomic status, and medical need, although the board could consider other factors as well. Three registered caregivers um, chosen by the board with the intent to create um, an inclusive and diverse advisory entity. And again, this, um, the board would choose from a list of volunteers from the registry. And again, the criteria should include um, geographical location, socioeconomic status, and medical need. Two licensed healthcare professionals um, with knowledge regarding using cannabis for symptom relief. Again, appointed by the board from a list provided by the Board of Medical Practice or lists provided by both the Board of Medical Practice and the Office of Professional Regulation. And then lastly, one licensed cultivator with expertise in medical strains that's appointed by the board from a list that's provided by um, an advocacy organization regarding Vermont cannabis cultivation. And then there's a recommendation that the board members, this advisory entity, the members serve a three-year term not to exceed two consecutive terms, and that vacancies are filled in the same manner as the original appointment for the unexpired portion of the vacated term. And then um, the recommendations with respect to the advisory entity's duties are that they meet at least six times a year for the purpose of evaluating public input and making recommendations to the board um, regarding the ability of patients and caregivers to obtain timely, affordable, and safe access to cannabis, um, the effectiveness of the registry and the licensed dispensaries in serving the needs of qualifying patients and caregivers, and then recommendations to the board on any best practices in administering the medical cannabis program. And then lastly, um, they would also be responsible for, um, in connection with the board, identifying how best to use any carryover funds um, from licensing fees or another appropriation to improve the services and products provided or to reduce the cost to registered patients. Great. Sorry, want me to keep it open? You might as well keep it open. Um, and if, if you could go back one slide, because I think um, we have a few deviations from the recommendation um, here that I'll, I'd like to note. Um, so with respect to this, um, this recommendation came to us from the Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, and it represents a tremendous amount of work, both from the committee members there, but also from members of the public, uh, current patients and caregivers that regularly attend those meetings. I think this is, um, you know, when they're, when Act 25 or S25 passed, you know, the, the board 
the Medical First Infant Relief Oversight Committee really only met once or twice a year, and they had to meet. Um, I can't even I can't even remember how many times to come up with this, and I think it achieves a lot of what I had asked them and what I think is important, um, which is that when we receive recommendations from this advisory board, this advisory entity, you know, I think it's important for the board to know that all interested stakeholder groups are represented. You know, I'm, we can't have perfect representation, of course, but at least we have six patients that are going to tr that we're going to try to achieve kind of a variety of interests, including geography, accessibility to the dispensaries, to the program, socioeconomic status and medical need, because not every patient has the same needs. There's terminal patients that are on the registry. There's people with chronic pain. There's people with incurable diseases um, and not everyone's needs are going to be the exact same. So I think that first point um, was really important. The caregivers um, is, of course, a huge component um, to the medical program. And uh, we have the same kind of interests represented there, um, you know, the same diversity of interests that, that are represented there. Um, one point of diversion from what the recommendation was um, to us from the um, Marijuana for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee um, relates to point C up here, um, which is who provides the lists. I think the original recommendation was that it'd be some sort of healthcare advisory board. Um, I talked to the Vermont Medical Society about what that really means. I think it was appropriate health advisory boards or something along those lines. Um, they suggested that these two boards encompass um, a tremendous amount of knowledge on all of the various entities uh, that can be, that are bona fide healthcare professionals under the law. So if we just did the board of medical practice, it wouldn't encompass, I think, naturopaths and some of the other people that can make recommendations or that can approve people for the registry. And so the Office of Prof Professional Regulation, um, you know, fills in the gaps where the, the medical practice might not have knowledge of certain types of healthcare professionals. So we got a little bit more specific. Um, I'm happy to convert it back, but I think this is the recommendation from the medical society. I think it makes sense. Um, the other divergence is in point D. I think it's very important to have a cultivator uh, with experience, expertise in medical strains. The recommendation from the uh, advisory committee specifically called out the Vermont Growers Association to make the um, list. Um, and while I would expect that they would provide us a list uh, under this language as well, um, I don't think it's smart to call out a specific organization in statute that potentially, you know, might not exist in 10 years. Not that I'm not saying anything about them, but it's just, you know, if they don't exist, then this person can't get appointed. So, um, or if they change their name, you know, so we did, we changed that, or I, I suggest we change that to Cannabis Cultivation Advocacy Organization. So essentially any Cannabis can Cultivation Advocacy Organization could submit a list that we would then get to pick from. And I would, again, very much assume that the Growers Association would be one of them. I think your reasoning there makes, makes sense. Agreed. Okay. So are we okay generally with this recommendation and then we can move to some of the others? Can I just ask one quick question? Was there any consideration about mental health and substance abuse? Adding someone from that field to this, was that part of their discussion? You know, I think it was part of their discussion. Currently, the only kind of mental health qualification um, that qualifies you for the registry is post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, so they, a PTSD patient could be part of one of the six patients, but there, are, and of course, you know, the mental health care or the licensed healthcare professionals could include um, people with medical expertise in those fields as well. So okay. I think it somewhat encom encompassed in this, not explicitly called out though. If the list of um, medical conditions changes, would this be like if there were more mental health or if substance abuse was added to the list of conditions sometime down the road, would this 
could the composition of this group change? Um, I think the three year terms, you know, you, you're kind of entitled to your three year term. Um, and so this this initial board, we could recommend that there be some staggering of appointments so that there's no, you know, so there's no like kind of quorum issues. And, and at that time, we would know maybe in a year from now whether the qualifying list would change. Um, I think that's something we might want to consider. OK. So maybe just, you know, this is I, I agree. Maybe we can just have just that there's going to be the initial appointments will be staggered. So that there's never more than one a couple vacancies at a time. Mm -hmm. um, and that will allow kind of at least the initial board to kind of evolve as the program evolves in in the first couple of years. And then. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, I think it all makes sense. And back to point D, I think it's 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 wise to not call out specific organizations. I think there was one called out in our advisory committee and folks felt a certain way about it right. and to kind of keep things a little bit open. Um, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. OK, how about recommendation three? So um, on this one, um, I'm very comfortable with this. Um, I think this is pretty much in line. It's not entirely in line, but it's fairly much in line with what the Vermont Medical Society recommended to the board. Um, you know, essentially what it is is these kind of high delta um, concentrates or isolates um, exist in a legal gray area right now and they are they are impairing um, and they should have some consumer protection and regulation tied to them and i think it's important to have someone um, be in charge of the of that regulation and compliance the agency of agriculture currently does not um, do it they they've said that this is not under the hemp it's not authorized under your hemp license to create these things or to sell them so um i think we should do it and then whether or not we ultimately allow them we could decide during the product registration process yeah i think i think it makes sense you know this has been interpreted differently across across the country on what's legal and what's not and i think it gets back to the word hemp derivative in the farm bill um, and whether or not synthetic derivatives are derivatives yeah. of the natural, you know, whether the word synthetic there changes its legality. But um, this is all it takes a lot of work and work specifically in a laboratory setting to really manufacture these products. And that being said, I think it makes sense if they're going to exist, they need to come under our oversight. Great. I'm comfortable with that too. Okay. So um, maybe we can start with the first part of, rec or I guess, recommendation one. So I think we all know the kind of uh, parameters of this dynamic, um, essentially because constant solid concentrates greater than 60% THC are per se prohibited, that they can exist at any point in the supply chain, even if they're being used as an ingredient at it for a product that ultimately is um, under 60%, a solid concentrate that's under 60%. Um, you know, I think our justification kind of spells out why that's probably not the wisest thing to do. Um, you know, this is concentrated THC is essentially an ingredient um, and it should be, you should know what you're putting into another product. It makes just measuring the amount of THC in the final product easier. Um, and more accurate, and it doesn't include adding some unknown substance to the mix. So I think this one, I don't have any problem with this recommendation. Likewise. Yeah, same. So this next one, um, this is kind of the subcommittee decided, the exploratory subcommittee went above and beyond kind of the charge and said, and by the way, solid concentrates, um, you know, above 60% should also be allowed, period. Um, and I think the rationale is laid out in our um, 
in our slides. Uh, I would say that you know the the medical society, um, Dr. Anley, Prevention Works. Um, I think they've all kind of been on the record saying that the that they do not want these products in the Vermont market. I um, have total respect for that opinion, and I you know I fully understand um, some of the arguments that they made, um, including the normalization of high THC products um, and the negative health impacts, particularly on adolescent and um, developing brains. You know, we have a different charge than that goes beyond just public health. We have a specific requirement to move as much of the illegal cannabis market into the regulated space. And so we can't kind of put our heads in the sand that these things don't exist on the regulated market on the unregulated market right now and that they're being used with in incredible frequency in Vermont and both the production of them is dangerous um, just the, the the way that they're being produced and you know the fact that it's an untested product that has um, questionable origins is also not within kind of what we're what we're trying to do with um, the you know, high THC cannabis market. So we really need to think if these products exist and they're being used, they should be regulated um, from a consumer protection angle. Um, I want to just say that uh, in my conversations with the Medical Society and the Department of Health and um, and some other folks, like I, I have read these reports that they've sent us and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of their comments. And I only feel I agree with a lot of what they're saying and there, there's science to back it up. So I honestly only feel comfortable with this. If we put a further prohibition on this, that solid concentrates um, could only be sold to people um, who are 25 and older. So there's a 21 year old restriction for THC in Act 164. I would say that if you're purchasing a concentrate, solid concentrate above 60%, you know, you have to be um, 25 or older, which I think is mostly consistent with the brain science and the primary concern, which is what I'm hearing about the kind of developing brain and the adolescent brain and the long-term potential health impacts. Does that pepper in your mind still meet the goal of moving it out of the um, illicit market? I don't you know, have a sense of, I don't know that we have any data on how many people between the ages of 21 and 25 use these products versus those above 25. What, anytime we prohibit anything, including the 21 age limit, there's going to be a black market for those products. Mm -hmm. I think what the 25 does is it signals to youth and others that these are very dangerous for certain segments of our population. Um, and we're trying to acknowledge that, you know, we're never going to have perfect compliance. Um, but I do think that um, having the increased age for these is one more indication that this is these products are dangerous for um, for folks. They, they may have long term health consequences for you if you're under that limit or under that age. So I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I just um, that was the first question that came to mind that and ensuring that there is you know, a fair amount of public education on the products as well, which is included in the recommendation. Yeah, and I can I can appreciate how we're we're attempting to thread like a proverbial needle here, um, right? I, I will say that I would imagine college age kids or those over the age of twenty one. You know, I know that you know they're they're moving away from using flour as their primary source of cannabis as it relates to cannabis products um you know that being said i think i would agree that typically the articles that we have been sent focus on that age of 25 and it it might make sense there i'm also i'm a little wary you know, we've all been teenagers when something's prohibited it makes you <laughs> it makes you want to seek out that product more um in certain ways so that's my only reservation but i think right now um I don't know, and I don't want to ask you to speculate, but this is a recommendation to the legislature, considering they, they're going to have to do their own contemplation of our recommendations. Do you feel like taking this off the prohibited products list might um, make folks a little bit more comfortable across the street 
if we were to raise that age to 25? Well, I, I wouldn't want to speculate on that. I, I wasn't in the room when this when this was first created as a prohibited product or added to the prohibited product list. You know, I think I asked Dave Silverman that question when he uh, when he was walking when he did a presentation for the board a few months back. Um, I think it's important. Um, I think it's an I think it's an important piece, and it's consistent with our charge to take this off the prohibited product list. And I think it's equally as important to make sure that we're recognizing some of the concerns that have been brought before us and the kind of the reports that we've seen um, from the Medi medical society and others. So, um, yeah, I'm comfortable with it. Just want to make yeah. sure we're cognizant that that 21 to 25 year old age group might be a, a substantial user of these these products and they're probably going to figure out ways to get them whether or not we regulate it yeah yeah but i'm i'm okay with it all right um it's a careful balance of moving you know the illicit market but also public health and, and youth prevention so i think it's a good suggestion to thread that needle. I think one, you know, one other piece of this is, you know, Pace Vermont, um, you know, Dr. Volante's project um, is tracking how public policy influences decision making amongst this exact age cohort. Um, and so I think if this were to kind of pass um, through the legislature, we would see what the impacts would be. And I fully recognize that kids are using these products right now. You know, I think it's important to make that distinction. They're just not regulated products. They're under, they're illicit market products. So, um, all right, any further discussion on the November 1st report? Should we just approve it now then? It's gotta go out tomorrow or the next day? Monday. Monday. Um, great, so I would take a motion to approve the November first report with the one um, additional uh, caveat of the 25 for 60% concentrates. Also the staggered terms for. And staggered terms, yeah. Um, so moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, um, next on our list is just a very brief review of the subcommittee um subcommittees um i forget which one's met i think sustainability and social equity yep julie do you want to just uh go first um second to um, fine i can go quickly while julie's finding her, her yeah, that would be good. I can be very brief. You know, the sustainability committee met um, yesterday. We didn't have a quorum. Billy Coster was not able to attend. So Jacob, Stephanie, Tom, and Gina and I had a very good overview conversation. We didn't arrive at any consensus or agreement on any remaining outstanding items. We're, what we're going to do is Jacob's planning to um, get our get the subcommittee's report out to subcommittee members by next Friday. And because we don't have any more standing meetings, we're going to just work through edits in a word document format um, to that report. And a, 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 the majority of the meeting yesterday, as I presented in one of my slides, was talking about operational farm plans and how that makes sense from a cultivation perspective and what, what makes sense to be required and then on on um, disposal of of adulterated cannabis. So that's, that's, I'm very thankful for all the subcommittees, uh, sustainability committees work. We covered a lot of ground in a very short amount of time. Awesome. Um, can talk about social equity. Yeah. So they met, I think, for the last time for a while. They finished their discussion on the DEI programs, um, acknowledging that we did not include um, like a socioeconomic status in the um, uh, social equity application um, eligibility. They included it in the DEI programs. 
um, and they set some income limits uh, or recommended set, setting some income limits at 135%, I think it was, at the federal poverty level. Um, and then they talked about the um, incentives and benefits of that program. So, ed, you know, continued educational programs, certifications of value. Um, they talked about recommending um, or are recommending priority processing. Um, and then also recommended reducing the application fee for people um, in the DEI program as well. So that wrapped their work for now. And then I think as you talked about earlier, Pepper, the next stage for social equity is um, is the town hall or town halls on the 18th and the 20th. Great. All right, well, why don't we pause for public comment? Um, and uh, after that is uh, done, why don't we um, vote on our uh, earlier slides? Um, OK, so if you've joined via the link, it looks like everyone's joined via the link. Um, please just raise your virtual hand. And Nelly, could you call them in order? Uh, first is Dave Silverman. Thanks, Nelly. Um, regarding the November 1 report, and realizing you've just voted on it, um, I, First, uh, I really appreciate um, your going beyond the uh, the remit a little bit on the solid concentrates and and uh, and, and fighting that fight um, with uh, that you know the legislature has uh, kind of I think made a mistake in in uh, in banning those products. Um, and, and I think you know because you're already going beyond the remit, it, it would be asking too much to ask you to go further beyond the remit and focus a little bit on subsection three of 868 prohibited products. Um, but I'd like to maybe just plant the seed. Um, so subsection three prohibits oil products, except uh, ones that are prepackaged for vaping. Um, you know, back in the House Health Committee, um, the the concern at the time, this was 2019, 2020, remember the whole Evali scare was going on. Um, and there was, and, and amalgamated within that was the whole concern about youth vaping that was going on nationally at the time. Um, and I think that that discussion in the health committee was driven by this concern of people buying juice and making their own vape mixes and you know, there's been some desire in the legislature to just ban all flavored vapes altogether, uh, because you know there are certainly some vape flavors out there that seem designed to attract children to nicotine addiction. Uh, and so I think that's kind of where all of that came from. And, and I think they settled on allowing vape cartridges because they saw the Valley Scare and they didn't want uh, black market vape cartridges dominating. You know, with whatever is in there that's, that was killing people at the time. Um, but this subsection three wasn't limited to prohibiting oil vaping products. It says all oil products, and that includes things like tinctures, or you know, if I wanted to make and sell just you know, THC infused uh, coconut oil for people to you know, take home and bake with, I, those things are not not implicated, not implicating the risks that the, I think the legislature was actually thinking about. And so I would love to see the board take that same approach that you took on, on the solid concentrates to these oil concentrate products and allow the market, the regulated market, to create a safe supply of this product category, of these product categories, while, you know, while respecting the legislature's, I think, proper concern with youth targeting flavored vapes. So thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, next is Amelia. Hi, guys. Um, so I had a couple thoughts. I have a lot of thoughts, but I'll just like talk about a couple and follow up privately. <laughs> um, so my first thought was um, retail establishments um, providing for medical patients, which I've obviously advocated for, um, in terms of their, uh, what they need to be able to do, um, they also need to adhere to ADA compliance. So if a retail establishment is going to provide for medical patients, they need things like 
if we're doing this separate entrance, which makes sense to me, um, that separate entrance needs a ramp, handrail, automatic door in my uh, in my idea. Um, they need ASL interpreters available by appointment or request. Um, there's a lot more than that, but just looking into if these retail establishments are also going to function as medical establishments, then they also need to be compliant with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, second, this discourse has happened a lot in the last year. There is and should be no difference in medical and adult use cannabis in terms of safety, in terms of the way it's grown, in terms of its final lab results, there should be no difference. So when we talk about what is medical cannabis versus what is adult use cannabis, the only real difference right now is the prohibited products and their THC caps. There is no difference in the quality of flour grown safely between medical and adult use cannabis. So when we think about that, we got to understand that if everybody is being held to the same standard of cleanliness, of sanitation, of what is and is not allowed in their inputs, there is no difference in that flower. Um, and finally, in terms of these, just as we're talking about these prohibited products and these THC caps, the medical dispensaries do not adhere to these THC caps. And I hear you when I hear that the, the concern is that people under 25 are going to use these high concentrates. People under 25 are already going to use those higher concentrates within the medical program. So we've got 18, 19 to 25 year olds in the medical program who will be using these concentrates, rightfully so, as their medicine. But we don't seem to be concerned about them when we're talking about the THC caps. We're only concerned about the adult use users of these concentrates. So I would just re personally, I know that if you cap or cap the age at which people are allowed to buy these concentrates over 60% at 25, it, you're just, the black market's gonna thrive in that specific aspect. Like these people aren't gonna stop using these concentrates. They're just going to find them in an illegal way, or they're going to join the medical program and buy them from the medical dispensaries. Um, so those were my only thoughts for here. Uh, obviously I'll follow up in private, but thank you. Thanks, Amelia. Next is Ben Mervis. Hi, everyone. Happy uh, last meeting of October. Thank you for your time and thank you for giving me this time. Um, I do want to quickly, without repeating what they said, uh, throw support behind Dave Silberman's request about the non-solid concentrates. Um, really great point, and I really strongly believe that as Amelia also said, anything that is prohibited will continue to exist and will lose all control over safety and access. Um, so definitely want to support that. Uh, specific to Kyle's slides on product manufacturing operational requirements, um, I wanted to note that product manufacturing didn't include the flower samples. Uh, which my understanding is some product manufacturers will also be manufacturing flower products that won't be exclusive to wholesalers. So just to see that included. Um, also, Kyle, I know you joked the talking about a pretty big safe at a certain point. Did just want to note that Massachusetts in particular um, does allow safes to also be rooms that are secured in the same way and have a similar thickness. So it doesn't have to actually be an installed safe. Um, with regards to the sample sizes, uh, I was just hoping to propose an alternative, which would be restricting the size of the sample as opposed to the total number of samples or total uh, weight of samples. Because realistically, if there are 10 retailers that you'd like to supply uh, samples to and you're even giving them a half gram, you're still gonna be over that four gram cumulative limit. Uh, so instead focusing on the size of the sample per uh, vendor that you're providing a sample to. With regards to retail operations, I am a big fan of deli style for nostalgic reasons, but I will just say in three years of California deli style experiences, I don't think I've ever been in a store without seeing either someone's nails or noses going into those jars. So really want to emphasize, I think, where that conversation went, which was the idea of having the bulk flour that can be uh, packaged deli style, but to have separate containers for actually sniffing. And also just to make sure the regulations do allow for those samples to be switched out and maybe even require 
that they be switched every time there's a fresh batch or harvest. Um, Because Kyle definitely hear you. People want to know the flower that they're looking at is the flower they're going home with. Um, I think we talked about them or Bryn brought them up in terms of the sniffers. Uh, And my last bit with uh, Chairman Pepper, with your slides about wholesalers, with regards to uh, how I think it's been defined in the law with transport package and processing, just urging you or or asking to please define process. Uh, I think that it's something I've heard a lot about uh, so far with people weighing wholesaler licenses versus product manufacturing is what that word process really is defined as. Is it simply, is it simply preparing the flower for market? Is it packaging? Anyway, just, just going into deeper detail with that. Um, and that's it for me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, Ben. Next is Graham Unangst Rufenacht. Hey, folks, and thanks, Nelly. That was an excellent pronunciation of my name. <laughs> <laughs> um, Graham Unangst Rufenacht, policy director at Rural Vermont, small farmer here in Marshfield, Vermont. Um, you know, one of the things that came to my mind as we were talking about the wholesale licenses and thinking all this through was, you know, is there currently a license that a facility like a food hub or a storage processing facility that was sort of available on a contractual basis, is there a license that would sort of meet that need? I think about myself, I, I go to the Center for Agricultural Economy, I store my, my beef in their freezers, um, and I can imagine that a lot of producers might not want to necessarily need to create a safety secure facility on their on their farm or at their business they might want to just contract that out and bring it somewhere where it's safe and secure and they can go and dispense it from there similar to like a commercial kitchen type facility where folks could manufacture product so just something to, to consider um, they're clearly super valuable in the ag- greater agricultural community currently um, I agree that we need to secure ongoing funding for the cannabis development fund I think our coalition member Jeffrey could speak more to sort of print uh, precedence for that around the country um, and we, re- we remain concerned that the integrated licenses are in statute allowed to test their own products. So we were sort of surprised to hear you suggest otherwise. And I just would love confirmation that, um, as I heard you say, that they are not allowed to test their own product. And they will also require third party testing. Um, that's what I heard in this meeting. And sort of along those lines, um, you know, we remain concerned about the priority and special treatments of these integrated licenses. I know this conversation came up a bunch today. They certainly need limits on their canopy like everyone else for retail cultivation. And we support the call for ongoing requirements for purchasing from small cultivators. However, you know, the dates the legislature offered currently really belied their lack of consideration for the outdoor outdoor and cult, small cultivators in particular, who for the most part will not have any harvests saleable by the point of retail sales or even during that August to October period of time. Um, and we recognize this isn't in your purview, but this isn't legislature's purview, but could certainly fit into your recommendations to adjust this timeline. And in general, you know, this conversation really lays out the fundamentally inequitable nature of the timeline and the market we're heading towards based on statute of integrated licenses can start selling on May 1st. Small cultivators and testing labs will have issues licensed May for uh, uh, licensed licenses issued May 1st and all cultivators on J- June 1st. Um, and given these businesses, the priority and benefit seems to be the outcome. Getting these businesses the priority and benefit, the integrated licenses, seems to be the outcome, if not the goal of this timeline, as opposed to getting a functional and equitable market in place. So if the concern is that demand will exceed supply upon initial opening, then we need to adjust this timeline such that small cultivators, retailers, direct sales, et cetera, are all equitably positioned with integrated licenses to meet this opening and demand. Um, support you getting to recommendations for the direct sales retail license. We think that would really be a low bar way of decentralized, a way of decentralized um, setting us up to meet the market demand in a decentralized fashion. Um, getting more of the illicit market, current quote unquote illicit market in, in into legal space, et cetera. Um, and, you know, currently if we're really focusing on getting these five integrated licenses to set up to meet the entire market or nearly the entire market, then we're we're essentially setting them up to have to necessarily have unfair market advantage, right? Like that's sort of the the line of logic there. Um, And really the businesses facing the greatest regulatory uncertainty right now are are not the integrated licenses. They're they're everyone else who don't have their their standards articulated in law. Um, From a cultivation perspective, you know, our coalition's perspective, as you know, is on licensing is we don't need to limit the number, rather the scale 
um, if, and find ways to facilitate the distribution of wealth and access as, as much as we can. Um, and some of these businesses may be run by one or a couple owner operators. And um, I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And, you know, contracting for particular needs, like processing out so they may not have employees. So some of these other social equity or prioritization criteria you're putting in place, um, whether it's about hiring and staffing diversity or wages, might not actually apply to some of these very small scale operations where it's just a couple owner operators sort of running the business and just think about what that could look like. Um, and just given the, the conversation around the delays of licensing, the potential backups there, I'm wondering if you had any estimates on how long you think it's going to take to get a license approved. You know, how much of a backup are we expecting? What can we do now to sort of limit the backup there? And um, yeah, I think the last recommendation was just in the medical realm where you I have can't hear a thing and sitting out here, the Internet goes in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And the Sorry. Sorry, Graham. <laughs> All right. Um, the last piece is um, you, know, you recommend this cannabis advocacy organization to be on the, the medical board. And I wonder if you could change it to a member based nonprofit cannabis advocacy just to assure that this is an organization that you know represents members. It's not necessarily represented by profit. It's, it's nonprofit. Um, we see that in a lot of other boards related to agriculture, at least around the state, um, which direct, you know, which is why we see the Farm Bureau, the Champlain Valley's Farmers Coalition, rural Vermont, Nova Vermont you know, on a lot of these boards. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you all. Thanks, Graham. Next is Tito Byrne. Hi, guys. Thank you so much for uh, for keeping caregivers on the Marijuana Symptom Relief Oversight Committee. Um, I, I was so happy to hear that. Um, I know there was several voices um, saying otherwise. I'm, I'm just so glad to hear that you landed on that. And that will really help to preserve the sacred relationship between grower and patient. Um, next, I want to elaborate a little bit on what Dave Silberman was, talk Silberman was talking about when he was referring to the flavored vapes. Also, um, we still have this crippling 92% wholesale vape tax, a sweeping tax um, that was originally meant uh, to combat the jewel problem in high schools, which we all agree is an awful problem, but they used language so broad uh, when they wrote the law that it it uh, it encompassed everything um, and, and products intended for cannabis. So if we can just get a carve out for intent, I think that solves the problem. Um, and because uh, uh, right now it's really just removing a whole host of great products that are intended for cannabis. So um, if we can get that done, that would be amazing. Um, and also, I don't like the 25-year-old um, age limit for concentrates. I feel like it's going to backfire. Um, it'll complicate things, and it may have, uh, it possibly may have low results. Um, thank you guys so much. Um, I hope you all have a great day. Thanks, Tito. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, next is Jesse Lynn Dolan. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me. Um, just a few things. I'll try to be quick because I know you guys are past your time. So my first thought or recommendation is I think you guys need more than 10 minutes of public comment because we all got a lot to say. Um, anyway, <laughs> as far as the THC cap, I agree and would second what Dave said and hope that you guys will consider making all products that are allowed in the medical dispensary to be allowed at the adult use as well, including those ethanol tinctures, which are so important and really the oldest form of medicine and especially cannabis medicine out there and, and different oils as well. And also look at that milligram cap, that five milligram edible cap is, is extremely low while we're talking about THC caps. I definitely am excited to have patients be able to shop at adult use dispensaries. I personally don't agree with a separate entrance. When I think about people who are disabled, the last thing they often want is to showcase it and make a big display about their disability rather than being hopefully part of the mainstream and us making accommodations to make the regular entrance handicap accessible. So that would be something I ask you guys to consider and think about. Um, I agree absolutely with Tito. The vaporization is the best and healthiest way for the inhalation consumption. So if that is something that can be addressed in the future. For the Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, I would love to see 13 members, just as someone who's been on a lot of different boards, having an even membership can be kind of tough. So I would love to see either another cultivator originally, but after Julie mentioned it, I think she is spot on and we absolutely should be considering having someone with substance abuse or mental health 
um, education and kind of knowledge experience in that area. And speaking of education, I would love to see part of the symptom relief oversight committee mandate being that they need to participate in a certain amount of education, um, as well as advisory committees, maybe looking towards some kind of education. Lastly, one or two other things. So like I said, I'm trying to be quick for you guys. Um, the 25 year old limit, I really do worry that that is just gonna push those 21 to 25 year olds back or keep them more solidly in that illicit market. In the illicit market, they have access to opioids. They have access to cocaine and crack. They have access to a lot of other stuff and they will not have access to that at a dispensary. So I just ask you to think about the other side of that. I. I reiterate, like everyone else said, it's not that they won't use the concentrates. They will find another place to get those concentrates, and that other place may not be safe and regulated comparatively. And lastly, I just wanted to throw in something Amelia mentioned to me and forgot to mention to you guys, is just looking towards the medical dispensaries as the larger and the integrated businesses to be the leader with environmental stewardship and have to do something from whether it is looking at something like clean green certification and just kind of leading the way and having a solid set of minimum standards for them to meet if they're going to have such large facilities and cultivation so that we really can protect some uh, some more environmentalism here so okay i think that is it thank you so much thanks jesse lynch uh, next is Jeffrey Pizzatullo. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your time. Can you hear me okay? Yep. yep. All right. Um, by the way, for the record, Jeffrey Pizzatullo, um, executive director of the Vermont Growers Association. Um, a couple points, uh, and thank you for this excellent meeting. Um, we would support what Kyle had raised with regards to single transfer for the vertically integrated license uh, as Colorado does. Um, we would ask that um, they get, as Colorado, no future transfers without board scrutiny. Uh, we think that is fair for them and also fair for the rest of the market actors, uh, those who wish to participate. Um, moving over to uh, funding of social equity program, uh, we would recommend uh, perpetual funding. Uh, in fact, that is needed uh, we can look at some other states where they have struggled with this, as you guys are probably well aware. For just about three years, Massachusetts struggled with an underfunded SE and EE program, for, so their social equity and uh, economic equity programs, with poor outcomes. They recently just adjusted, so we would ask that you, um, as a state, we avoid that. Um, and it's also just really quickly why our coalition does suggest a baseline of 250000 for the integrated license type. Not only are these MSOs uh, currently um, receiving profits from stores in other states, unlike any other Vermonter, but um, it needs to be perpetual. Uh, funding is critical. I cannot stress that enough. Um, moving over to Delhi style, in our, uh, in our conversations with um, advocates in Oregon, uh, they have success with Delhi style. So that's basically distribution and packaging on premise. Um, they don't have to do that, but they have that option. So we think that you guys should provide that option and we appreciate Kyle bringing that forward. We would advise against sampling, however. Um, lots of times sampling is the prized, more desirable product of the flower for enticing the consumer. What happens to that sample afterwards? Is it destroyed? Are they allowed to resell it? Uh, we, would, we would simply urge uh, allowing uh, sealed packaging on site uh, as an option for retailers. Uh, and there's some pretty good um, individuals from Oregon that we can bring in to speak to that. Um, lastly, uh, I just want to mention, uh, I appreciate you uh, uh, entertaining the subcommittee bringing forward recommendations for the THC caps. We would urge that you apply that to flour as well. Um, so, uh, you know, the 30% uh, THC cap for flour, uh, what I'm hearing is remained. Whatever you guys decide for solid concentrates, we would urge that you do the same thing for flour. Uh, Cultivators are routinely growing over 30 and even now 40% THC. We should not have that limitation here in the state. It will set us back. Thanks for your time. Thanks. So um, I think uh, we're going to stop public comment there. I see Tito, your hand up. We were past our public comment limit and uh, just because you've made a comment already, but please do feel free 
to submit um, through our website. Our, we have a public input forum there, and we'll see what you have to say. And we will be meeting again next week. So um, I think uh, we need to vote on the proposals that we brought forward this morning. Um, Bryn, do you want to review kind of some of the changes and we can just have a discussion? Sure. Um, so you made changes, several changes or clarifications. The first was regarding the cultivation sites operating requirements, um, specifically visitors to cultivation sites. Um, you wanted to add that uh, the licensee should have a diversion plan in place if they allow visitors and that uh, the limit on visitors should be consistent with the licensee's fire safety plan. Diversion prevention. All right. Yeah. Plan diversion. <laughs> Not a plan for diversion. Okay. Um, the second was integrated licensee operational requirements. Um, and you had discussed adding to the integrated security recommendations, maintaining a separate entrance and partition for medical and adult use. Do you want to discuss that? Um, so on that, I hear Jesse Lynn's point. My concern is separate from that. My concern is that the retail, if they're co-located, that the retail could be at capacity and a medical patient would not have the ability to go get, pick up their medicine. So I still think that a separate location and partition might be important. I think Amelia's points about um, being ADA compliant are, are spot on, and that needs to be a part of any retail establishment that's that's going to enter the medical or sell medical product as well. I agree with that, although I think um, I think ADA is probably a requirement in building code, but I don't I don't know that for certain. Um, and your concern, um, Pepper, about medical, I think it's Massachusetts allows like um, a fast pass for lack like of an easy pass line. What's that? Yeah. Like an easy pass line. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> where, you know, if, if you are a medical patient, you get to pass the line and, and enter. And I wonder if that's a way of, of um, meeting the concern um, that you have. It's, it's really just, and, and maybe that's a better way to do it. I guess maybe we should just say that if we're not going to do separate entrance, that there's, um, you know, guaranteed access for medical patients on demand. Um, you know, and they do currently have a like invitation, invitation RSVP, like time slot system set up. But um, my concern is just you're at capacity with adult rec patients, fire code capacity, and then a medical patient shows up. Um, you know, you kick someone out to let them in, move them to the front of the line. I don't really care how it works. I just, I don't want, um, yeah, I just want to make sure that there's some sort of access for the folks that um, are using this as medicine. Can we general, generalize our language right now, recognizing that, and we can take and listen yeah. to more public comment over this as we develop our rules over the- So insured access yeah. for medical patients for, yeah. for co-located uh, retail and medical and use. We can We're, hold some conversations with some, yeah. some patients who feel like they might be looked at in a different light if, yeah. if it's a known that they're going into an entrance. So yeah. I can appreciate that perspective. <clears throat> okay. So the next change you made was to the wholesaler operational requirements, which was to remove the requirement, um, the requirement regarding compliance with alcohol trade practice restrictions, and instead go with the recommendation on consistent pricing strategy across the state. Yeah. Um, and then finally, the integrated operational requirements, a couple of changes here. The first was to remove the date restriction for the 25% of flour um, being from licensed small cultivators. Um, so that's an ongoing requirement. And then uh, a dispensary is able to cultivate and manufacture for the purpose of transferring, to transfer only upon approval by the board, and to remove um, the separate inventory piece um, for the adult medical use point for now, and we can return to that next week after hearing some more input. Yeah, and, and we didn't necessarily hear any, I, I think, input on on that specifically. I think Amelia started to try and tease out a point that I want to make sure that I think we're all on board with, that the medical products and the, and the regulated products for the adult use should be treated the same. 
I, I certainly appreciate that. And I was not trying to in, to insinuate that they shouldn't be. My still concern, and I'm, I'm hopeful to have some conversations with folks who might have opinions on this next week as it relates to, do we need to keep those cultivation sites separate from an inventory perspective, not just yeah. rely on software? I think my question was, is it? And I think what we're hearing is it shouldn't be. Right. Shouldn't be it allowed or? No, Should, is it growing? My, my, question, my question was that I wanted to hear public comment on, is it different between adult use and medical use in terms of the, the cultivation? And what we're hearing, I think what we just heard in public comment is that whether it is or isn't currently, it shouldn't be. Yep. My only concern is diversion that we don't know about to the recreational market without our express. And will that be harder to, to track? But yeah, let's explore this more. So I'm just thinking out loud here on the 25%. I know we all kind of decided on that, but essentially what we're saying is that if we're going to allow, and we haven't decided the integrated licenses to have the same canopy as the highest tier, we're actually saying 25% lower than the highest tier. So, I mean, and you know, that would actually put them potentially at a disadvantage considering we are actually allowing vertical integration of other entities. They just have to apply separately for their licenses. So um, really the, the primary advantage of being an integrated license holder is this head start advantage and this unlimited grow capacity. But what we're saying is we're going to limit that eventually, but we're going to limit it in a way that we're, we're giving them an, an additional disadvantage that we're not going to require of other high, higher tier cultivators. I don't think I followed that. I'm sorry. Well, OK, let's just say in a world where we have a license type of 25,000 square feet. And what we're saying is we're going to limit the integrated licensees to 25,000 square feet of canopy, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever our highest tier. If we have any ongoing perpetual commitment that they have to purchase 25% of their stock from a um, from small cultivators, and what we're saying is actually, you know, their canopy is less than what other people would have, you know, because they because other 25,000 square foot cultivators don't have that requirement. Does it matter at which point they're purchasing it? Like if they have 25,000 square feet of cultivation, but they're they might sell like they might be purchasing it from small cultivators just for their retail or their. So they could sell over their 25,000 square feet of canopy is what you're saying, as long as all of anything excess comes from a small cultivator. That's what I'm thinking. That's in a world where we have a 25,000 square foot right. license. Right. Though. But whatever the highest is, let's just say it's 10,000. I think it's important that we keep the 25% from small cultivators right now i recognize your concern well it, i mean we could just say that that's in addition to the whatever canopy we're allowing them the 25 they could sell above as long as 25 percent of their sales above come well i mean whatever they go above their their supply they get from small cultivators i would say i'd, I'd how about if we do that but after october 1st so we continue this trend up until the stores close and then instead of the clean continuance after October 1st, we incorporate what your your concern. Does that make sense? I feel like we're all getting a little muddy in this after a four hour meeting. I'm sorry. Um, what if it's their retail inventory it has to be 25% from small cultivators? Does that Are we overthinking this, David? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, I suggest that we return to this next week. There, you've had quite a bit of discussion on it. Okay. I think you may hear some more feedback after this uh, okay. conversation. And but at a minimum, we should have the plan for 25% for the time period that's spelled out in statute. That's in statute, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so let's return to let's return to what happens after whatever it is, October first or whatever the date is. Uh, the end date. Twenty-two. Yeah. All right. We'll return. We'll we'll cap it the way it's written in statute for now as our recommendation, and then we'll return to the issue about what to do on an ongoing basis. Okay. Is that it, Bryn? That's it. I wanted to, to, I appreciate Ben's eagle eye at some of my slides. Um, thank you, Ben. And I appreciate Jeffrey's perspective on not being very fond of sampling. I think under the correct type of sampling regulations and, and guidance that we can provide on representative sampling, not just your, you know, the best potential sample that you could possibly provide with the intent to mislead somebody else in the supply chain, I think we can manage that appropriately. And so I'm still for um, providing samples. I think it's ways to craft relationships amongst members of the supply chain. But but um, but to Ben's point, I think it was just the way that I wrote this. I wasn't thinking about it of a of an ounce in aggregate to all prospective vendors you might be working with, but to each perspective vendor that you might be working with. So that means if I want to send an ounce or four four grams of seven different strains to retailer A, I can also do the same thing to retailer B and retailer C as long as it's accounted for in seat to sale. So that was how I thought I was presenting it. And if the two of you clearly was taken differently on the on my slide deck and on our part of our conversation, but I didn't know if that was how you took it as well. I I heard it the way that you said it. Okay. Yeah. Same. And then as far as and then as uh, and then um, and this is just my 11 p.m. cut and paste job trying to do things equitably across different parts of the supply chain. Thank you, Ben, for recognizing that I didn't include or cannabis necessarily in the manufacturer slot, and we can just add that in and those same those same gram and strain limits in addition to the milligram uh, for edibles and, and concentrates that I had proposed for the manufacturing sector. As long as you everybody's cool with that. Yeah. All right, you got all that, Bryn? Every word. <laughs> all right, perfect. Um, then can we have a very similar motion, Julie, that we did last week? I think I said so moved is what I said. I think Bryn came up with the motion. So, so I think that your, your motion is to um, Vote, you're voting on the package of recommendations contained in the slides as amended in our discussion. So I move to vote on the package of recommendations as contained in the slide as amended by our discussion. Vote favorably or approve. Vote, vote to approve. Move if you're voting to approve, yeah. Yes. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, um, that's the end of our agenda. And so um, next week, um, I think we're going to cancel our Wednesday meeting um, and we'll meet again at this time, Friday at 11. Um, and uh, with another round of regulations to approve. So um, I will adjourn the meeting.